I'm joined by Council Members Cardenas and Zion. We will have an, a separate item for uh, uh, Councilman Zion as Chairman of the P Personnel Committee uh, as soon as uh, uh, Chief McCarthy gets here. In the meantime, we'll begin with our regular agenda. So item number one. Good morning, John White, City Clerk. Item one, communication from the Mayor extending by six months the temporary appointment of Ms. Kathy Davis as the Interim General Manager of the Department of Animal Services. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, council members, how are you? All right. So you ready for another uh, temporary term, I presume? <laughs> I've been uh, uh, doing my level best to obviously run the department in the best interest of the council and the citizens of our community, and I hope that's been pleasing to the mayor as well as to the council. I'm happy to accept an additional six months, obviously, with your blessing. Just have one question for you that deals with uh, staffing at our, our centers and, and the problems we're having. Uh, keeping some of them fully open and, and some of the services available. Uh, obviously, with the, with the staffing cuts, with uh, ERIP coming up, uh, are we going to be able to maintain, and really it's kind of almost a budget finance committee question, but are we going to be able to maintain all of our centers open uh, for the coming year? Uh, Mr. Smith, right now we have six public six centers that are open to the public and one that is not open. Our Northeast Mission Center is not open. We use that for evidence animals and for our ne neonates and other situations. Um, we are struggling with our staffing situation. We obviously have not hired any uh, for any vacancies in more than two years. In addition, the ERIP along with the um, work furloughs equates to roughly a 30-person deficit in the department. So we're losing the productivity of 30 additional people, which is basically one entire center. Um, we are doing the level best that we possibly can. We're certainly filling in with volunteers where we can. I think it will be a – we feel we have staff sufficient to be able to hold on until the end of this fiscal year. We certainly don't know what the next fiscal year will bring to us. but. Um, we're mapping out those possibilities, and we'll bring those suggestions back to you, depending on obviously what the CAO recommends from a, a, a um, financial standpoint for next year. And you say you, you project with ERIP it's 30 additional or 30 total? We have 11 people that are signed up for ERIP. We've lost, um, I believe, uh, at least two, maybe three of those already. And um, we have obviously lost the productivity of about 19 people through the work furlough program. So overall, out of the total component of the department, that's a reduction of? The productivity of 30 people. 30, was that what percentage-wise, what would you call that? Um, about 8 percent. About 8 percent loss of productivity. Okay. Mr. And that's on top of the vacancy rate. On top, of, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Smith. The uh, term of uh, interim general manager, what outreach have you done with the community since you've been the interim general manager? I think we've done substantial outreach. No, you, not the department, you in particular. Any outreach with the community, any community meetings, any community groups? I've been to the DAWS meetings. I've attended um, other meetings with our New Hope partners, with um, the Spay-Neuter Advisory Committee. Um, I was Saturday, I was at the training um, program that we have with our volunteers. Um, they're teaching them customer service skills in advance of our, our big event for the adoption, discount adoption days that culminates with an event on Saturday where we have found animal foundations coming in to assist us with some further promotions to adopt our pets. And then what about employees? Have you had any meetings with any of the employees at any of the shelters during your term in this position? I am at most of our centers. Um, I usually visit at least three centers a week. Um, I hold meetings with supervisors on a very frequent basis. Those mostly happen um, anywhere from one to four a month. And then what about with the union that represents the employee groups? Have you had any meetings with them? We have had some meetings with them. We're discussing scheduling and hours with the union uh, representatives. We've done that at least two times in the past five months. And how grievances? How are the grievances within the department? We have one grievance that I'm aware of right now that uh, has to do with the reduction of hours. Okay, thank you. Ms. Harness? Yes, thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the uh, process of 
picking a, a permanent general manager. Are you aware at all of any of that process where it's at at the moment? Yes. The as of this particular moment, there is a um, national headhunter firm that is working with the mayor's office to uh, pull together um, and interview people from the community as well as some employees, I believe, to talk to them about the qualities for the next general manager. That job description will be prepared and the application process will be open. Just the next steps in the process to the best of my knowledge. So there's a firm who's right now charged with gathering information and or input from the community? That's correct. Do you know what format that they're doing that in? Are they meeting privately? Are they having public meetings? I mean, what, what forums are they using in order to gather that information? Uh, Councilman Cardenas, they're meeting individually is what I've been advised by the mayor's office. Okay. Um, I know that our commission members, some of our commission members have, been, have talked to them. Some of our employees have talked to them. And my understanding is that there's also a list of community members, but I, I don't know their names. Um, so who who would be able to answer that question as to uh, answer the question as to whether or not the firm uh, it's within their contract and responsibilities to afford perhaps some public opportunities for them to sit and listen to the public in a public forum to get that kind of input? The mayor's office is handling that the recruitment and Jim Bickhart is the pers point person I believe that's handling the recruitment. Who is that? Jim Bickhart. Just Jim Bickhart. Just so if, if I had a question like that, I should ask that to Jim Bickhart? Yes, sir. Okay. Is Jim Bickhart in? <laughs> Can you please come forward, Jim? Ms. Davis was uh, apprising the committee of the fact that uh, there's a third-party firm that is gathering information and input in order to uh, put forth the proper process in order to pick a permanent manager, general manager for the Department of Animal Services. And the question that I asked and uh, was basically referred to the mayor's office or to you is, um, is it within the authority or responsibilities of the firm to have perhaps some public forums in which they can bring uh, get input? Because it sounds to me as though they are getting a lot of input from the community, but it's mostly being done in sit-down meetings with different individuals and, and interested parties. So far, that has been the case, yes. There's, uh, I think over 30 people have been individually interviewed along with the Animal Services Commission and several members of the staff of the department. Um, it's, if, the, uh, if there is going to be any public forums, that will have to be something uh, you know, agreed upon between the mayor's office, the personnel department, and, and the search firm. We have not gotten that far along in the process yet to determine. Yeah, but I, I'm talking about uh, a public forum where the public can give input. That's not, what I mean. Not when it comes to picking the person. Right. That's that's later on. That certainly is going to be separate than, than public forums on actually picking somebody. Right. Because it's a personnel matter. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, to some degree, certain aspects of the process are being determined as we're going along. Okay. We're just getting ready to finish up the job description right now and put it out so we can start uh, so the search firm can start gathering candidates um, they're going to continue talking with people in the humane community professionals from around the country uh, experts in the field to uh, get suggestions for candidates to go after and for uh, places to look for candidates uh, the question of doing a public forum to, to say either talk about the process or to uh, you know, once we get to the point of having sort of semi-final candidates, for example, to, to uh, have the public have a chance to talk with them. This has not been determined yet. Okay, I hope all that happens, what you just described, but I'm, I'm, you're way ahead of me. What I'm talking about is as far as having a public forum where members of the public, not necessarily only members of uh, specific organizations of the 30 or so that are being uh, talked to or interviewed by this firm in order for them to... Uh, put together the, the, the details of the process. I'm talking about the opportunity for there to be a public forum where this firm or representative of that firm is taking note and taking notes of what the concerns and what the input of the community is What when they, uh, as far as what they feel they would need or expect in a general manager uh, of a department that is, is covering an issue that is near and dear to them. So l let me just finish by saying this. What I, what I would ask of you is that you report back either to the, the committee, and, and if that's not timely enough because of, you know, we're going to be breaking pretty soon for a couple of weeks, if you could communicate to my office as to whether or not 
there is uh, any obstacles, uh, legal obstacles or financial obstacles or what have you, that would not allow this firm to actually engage in such a public forum as soon as possible. For example, perhaps they could actually do it at one of the commission meetings uh, and make that part of the agenda because that's a public meeting and it's recorded, et cetera. And that's the kind of meeting where a lot of these individuals who probably want to speak up on this matter would actually uh, come to these meetings and be uh, aware of these meetings as well. Is that is that something that you could report back? Well, I can I can tell you right now that no such forum will take place before the job description is released because the job description will be released before the end of this year and we're essentially running out of time for setting up a forum during the holiday season. Uh, if we were going to hold such a forum, it would have to be sometime after the first of the year and. I don't see any legal or financial obstacles. This is a, it's actually a matter of strategy. Okay. All right. Well, whether we would get any more input of a different sort than we've already gotten from uh, uh, surveying several hundred people and then interviewing over 30. But you never know. You never know. That's true. Right. You, you might find a gem of a recommendation in one of these forums. You might have somebody from the public who actually lives, breathes, eats this issue and actually uh, mention something that perhaps uh, you might have somebody come forward who hasn't chosen to come forward before who was actually a general manager of such a department at one time and actually give some input that might be valuable. Is that the, is that possible? I think you would agree with I think that, anything right? Anything is possible. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so rather than us to assume that because of these 30 individuals and or organizations have the breadth and knowledge and experience to give us everything that we need, I would strongly recommend that you start putting together that public forum. If for some reason you can't put together that public forum, please let this committee and myself know. In addition to that, I would like to know what is it that this firm is doing to meet and or communicate with particular council offices that seem to have a strong interest in this matter? They will be contacting the council offices over the course of the next month and a half during the as this search is going on to get your input directly but not before they put out the job description I would think that if they do it before the you they put out the job description it will be a matter of whether or not they can actually connect with you before the before say Christmas okay thank you okay we do have one public comment Phyllis Doherty Good morning. Phyllis Storty, and I'm going to speak as uh, Director of Animal Issues Movement, also as a former city employee. Um, I really want to support the uh, extension of the appointment of Mrs. Uh, Davis. Um, for several reasons, she and Linda Barth have really had a chance to actually look at what needs to be done inside this department and start reconstructing the things that we have been talking about, the administrative code, um, the uh, municipal code sections that are so out of date, and to bring someone in that doesn't know the city and expect them to work with what we have. We're just going to be repeating. Was it Einstein said that you keep repeating the same thing, expecting different results? Um, we don't. We know what that is. Um, so they are doing a wonderful job. Some of that will be demonstrated today. Uh, another thing is not having to deal with the super ego, somebody out there that wants to be God rather than is interested in, in actually working with the problems of this city has allowed them to progress. Um, there was a, a um, very, very large survey sent out, went out to, from what I understand, a, a thousand people. I think we all got it on uh, what we would like to see in a general manager. I think maybe everybody else forgot about it. Uh, it went to all the employees. It went to everyone that ever attends a meeting. Prob I would the thought it would have come to your office, and that was about maybe a month and a half ago. So there has been a large amount of input from the public. And we don't tend to get the public coming to the, the meetings, commission meetings, or any of the other meetings on this subject. They just don't take the time and they don't have the knowledge. So maybe that was the most beneficial thing. I just want to mention one other thing. that the, One of the things that is helping is that the emphasis is not now on this no-kill myth which has been dropped by the rest of the country at the end of the 90s and was only brought to the city of Los Angeles when the skeleton suits were on Jerry Greenberg's porch and Han said, keep them away from me. And he went to Phoenix for one weekend and came back and had been redeemed. And that's how No Kill started. It's impossible. It will kill this department and it will kill every person that you bring in because it's an impossible standard and it gives ammunition to critics that know nothing about uh, this kind of work. 
Thank you, Ms. Doherty. That concludes the hearing. Uh, we have a motion to approve the extension. So moved and ordered by the committee. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for your continued service. And uh, good luck. <laughs> All right. Now, we have uh, Chief Beck here. I know he's very busy. We have uh, passed the 945 time frame for the special meeting. So we will recess the regular meeting of the Public Safety Committee. We will adjourn, uh, excuse me, we will call into session the special meeting for item number one with the Personnel Committee, Mr. Zine present, and myself. And here on item number one, special. Special one, see a report relative to Los Angeles Police Department hiring and attrition triggers. I can have Chief Beck come forward. I know you want to speak on this matter. And uh, the grid office, Guillermo, and any other staff? Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. <laughs> this is not the special item because that's the police hiring. I'm sorry. We're going back. All right. We'll go back. Let's combine the two agendas, and we'll go back into item number five, which now is. Yep. Thank you. There we go. Item five: communication from the mayor and see a report relative to the awarding of a contract in the amount of two hundred thousand dollars for a twelve-month period to the advancement project to be the Los Angeles Violence Intervention Training Academy provider. All right, Chief, thank you for being here, and uh, sorry for the confusion. That's, that's all right, uh, Councilman. I would have been glad to talk about anything, although I would, have, I would not have been prepared on the other one. <laughs> you know, I want, to, uh, I, want to, I, want to thank, um, I want to thank this committee. This is the culmination of what uh, uh, Guillermo and Commander Gannon, or Chief Gannon, soon to be Chief Gannon, uh, it start today. Does that mean that it's imminent, or has it happened? It's happened, but we haven't done the swearing in. So, Thank you. so it's a, it's a, uh, and and, and uh, Chief Gannon will be going to South Pier, as you all know, which uh, of course is is um, an area that desperately needs programs uh, like the Violence Intervention Training Academy. So we've been working on this to get to this point for the past four years. It's a, it is a huge piece of my uh, uh, gang violence reduction strategy. Not only on the, not only because this academy is intended to train intervention workers and professionalize them, but also uh, as an introductory course to police officers uh, as to the as to the benefits and realities of working with gang intervention. So it's a it is a huge uh, uh, two piece program that I think is is integral to everything that we've been doing. And and I, I'm going to let uh, Guillermo and, and Pat talk more specifically about the process, but but. Uh, uh, the, the selection of AP as the uh, as a vendor in this, I think, is extremely well thought out. They're, they're an organization that has been involved uh, with us uh, since the beginning. Uh, I think that they uh, bring uh, to the table many things and that uh, that others cannot because of their the the individuals involved. Uh, and I just cannot overstate the importance of of uh, professionalized intervention and continuing down the path that, that we've been going for the last several years. And the results are, uh, the results have been very, uh, very significant. Gang homicides are down 18% so far this year. They were at the, the lowest point in decades last year. Uh, we've made tremendous strides. And a lot of it is because of the, of the collaboration between the police department and intervention. So I, I applaud this committee and I ask that you move this forward. Thank you, sir. Again, anything to add to that? Well, yes, I, um, I had the opportunity to sit on the um, uh, committee that evaluated each of the um, uh, bids for this intervention academy. And um, I, I, I was asked to, to participate by the mayor's office, um, so I want to say that up front. But I also had, to, we took a look at, there was three bids that we were asked to evaluate. Um, and of the three bids, um, two of the bids were um, extremely good. And the third bid was way out in left field. But the two that, that we're, we're, we're talking about, the AP and the other one that was uh, put together by uh, Akil Bashir and Better LA uh, was also a, a good uh, proposal. But it wasn't up to the standard of uh, the advancement project and what the advancement project could bring to this, uh, to this arena. And uh, I, I, I strongly believe that the process in which this was done was fair. Um, the other people that were on the evaluation board, um, I didn't know personally, uh, and they came from throughout uh, the country, actually. And we part I participated in, in a, uh, a conversation and as part of the evaluation, a, a conference call with each of them. And it was surprisingly how close 
each of the scores were um, for all three of the all three of the bids. One bid that was uh, way out in left field, and uh, and and then the the two bids and the bid for the uh, uh, for the advancement the advancement project, which ultimately won. Uh, it was incredibly strong. The advancement project was incredibly strong, as the chief said. Um, th this is incredibly important, and the inter the professionalism of the interventionists by using through this training academy has to come to some uh, has to be accomplished. And uh, it would be nice to be able to bring everybody together and have people agree and and use a collaboration of people and. Uh, to achieve this academy, that hasn't been done, so it it had to go out to uh, to an RFP, and somebody um, was, and there was a fair bidding process, and it, and the advancement project put the best the best pro process forward or best bid forward, and 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 to be perfectly honest, having been here in LA and having seen what what goes on, and having seen everybody who participates in gang intervention uh, from the police perspective. I think that AP is in the best position to be able to support this. So I give it my um, overwhelming support. Okay. And before I get to the mayors, I want to ask two questions. One, from the point of view of why you chose AP, what was it that they did outstanding that uh, was lacking in the other bids? Well, first of all, the, the one bid that was done by a, by a Whittier group that was a couple of um, uh, FBI agents who took a completely different <laughs> Look at uh, at intervention than than we as a city have have taken a look at. That wasn't even wasn't even close. I think the difference between AP and and the uh, Akil Bashirs and in a better LA um, was that th th there's a philosophical difference in the in the better LA um, process or, or or bid. It's it's a very much a practitioner type of. Um, Teaching method or a method of, of training, in and in the advancement project, it is, in my opinion, both practitioner but 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 philosophical in its in its approach. I thought that the um, uh, the the partnerships from from the advancement project and what they can bring to the table were were much better uh, in the uh, in that particular uh, in that particular process and I believe that in an, in an evaluation of, of this whole um, uh, as to the effectiveness of the intervention academies could best be done uh, by people who have already been in this process for a, for a long time it could bring a lot of uh, independent look at, at this uh, at this area so I, I think that that from my perspective it was it was that it wasn't I mean, I don't want to downgrade the the, the other uh, bid because it was good, but it just wasn't up to that standard. Okay. And that would bring me then with the second question: Is there something that AP can pick up from Better LA's bid to make their project even better? No, I, I, I didn't. I didn't see that personally. No. Okay. Mayor's office. Guillermo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, back in August of um, '09, um, we released. Uh, well, this RFP was released as a result of a motion that was made by Councilman Cardenas. We collaborated. Our office wrote up an RFP. We sent it to Mr. Cardenas's office. They had input into the RFP. They made several suggestions. We incorporated them. Um, by all standards, I think this has been one of probably the most collaborative RFP processes that we have had. Um, at least that's what I get from your staff. I, I, I want to comment on that if you allow me, Mr. Chairman. You, Mr. Cespedes is absolutely correct. Uh, in, in this process, uh, I was afforded an opportunity for us to dialogue and for us to make recommendations, and it was very collaborative and uh, very fortunate that we were able to come to a meeting of the minds on many, many uh, details and aspects of it, which I think made it a better process than had we not had that collaboration. All right. So correct. thank you. Thank you. Um, we released the RFP um, and received three proposals, as you know, has been stated. And um, at that point, on November 19th, we received one um, letter of appeal um, from one of the components of the ABLA proposal. Um, the letter was from Maximum Forces. On November 24th, we received a letter several days later withdrawing that appeal. 
from both ABLA and Maximum Forces. This decision, um, and members are here from the Executive Director, they can speak to that. Um, we went through the process, um, contracted, not contracted, but made contact with five experts from throughout the country. Some that were highly recommended through the League of 13 Cities, which is a network of gang prevention and intervention services throughout the state. Um, some came from as far as Chicago. And I believe in the transmittal, it's clearly outlined all the biographies and all of that. The um, proposals were rated. And then after they were rated, we initially did a a surface review to make sure that all items were in order. Once they were rated, our staff read the proposals. I read the proposals after the panel, um, concurred with the opinion of the panel. Um, at that point, we decided to make sure that we would fully evaluate not just the proposal, but the issues of um, how do we incorporate other intervention workers as part of the certification process. Now, it's really important to understand as we frame this discussion is that we're not just talking about a training program. We're not just talking about a class. We're talking about a structure. A structure that provides a curriculum committee they will be able to evaluate curriculum, make changes in the curriculum, um, evaluate whether intervention workers are learning from the curriculum, as well as evaluate methodology of teaching. The second item that is part of the proposal is the Professional Standards Committee, which is crucial. We don't have currently, there is no Professional Standards Committee currently, and this is this, the board or the committee that will evaluate the performance of intervention workers. They will recommend corrective actions, um, and, um, and in essence, they will be responsible for certifying those intervention workers. The mayor's office will continue in the role of doing background checks, fingerprinting, the mandatory drug testing. The academy will do the certification as a practitioner. Um, and the third component of of this bid is the executive committee, the advisory committee, um, that this academy must be led with input from various sources. And we actually required um, in the proposal three components to the advisory committee. One was the mayor's office, the grid office. Second was LAPD. And then the suggestion made by um, Mr. Cardenas' office, a member of the Public Safety Committee. So initially, we started with three people in the advisory committee. Uh, the advancement project then expanded that committee to include girls and gangs, the LA Sheriff's Office, um, um, the County Human Relations Commission. So in essence, they um, expanded that, that uh, function. It is important that we recognize here that this is about a training, um, a comprehensive training approach that is not just a training class, but curriculum development and curriculum monitoring and the ability to monitor how teachers teach and how students learn. A professional standards committee that will finally be able to certify and um, led by practitioners, by the way, all of the members that have been listed in the Professional Standards Committee, they're all they're practitioners, they're all here. Um, and of course, the advisory committee that will be our joint role, along with public safety, in overseeing this academy. So it's important to understand that this is not just a training class. This is not just a course. This is an overall structure. Um, once all of that, once we read the proposals, we went back and asked um, the person from our office who led the process of, um, of the RFP whether any requests on the part of any of the members to conduct a site visit. Um, it was not. It was a very clear process. Um, there were very obvious reasons for conducting a site visit in most cases. In our office, they have been done 
when the scores are between one and five points in difference, or when it's requested by the um, review panel. In this case, it was not. We were very aware that this is a very important step. They were not. So there were two issues related to that. One, three issues. One, it was not requested by the review panel. Um, number two, the platform is not in place. So it's hard to make a visit. And um, yes, sir. No, no, to the chair, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to ask him for permission to speak. Okay. And, um, and the third reason the scores were very far apart. Although 10 points in the context of this process doesn't seem like a lot it is. <clears throat> we then reviewed all of the proposals that had been, all of the RFPs that had been done by our office. Um, and the, the margin of, of error, there has never been a change in score even when there was a one point difference you know, as a result of a site visit. So that has been our process. We, I currently, you know, fully agree with the decision of the review panel. Um, I fully agree with the issue of um, this being the best platform to move forward with for the following reasons. It's got organizational capacity. It is very specifically identified. It specifically identifies who will serve where. All of those members have been identified. They're all here. They can speak on behalf of the proposal. It is very clearly articulated, and it is the structure that the city is looking for. I concur with Commander Gannon that there are other issues that this academy will have to address, such as how do we certify non-grid contracted intervention workers, and all of that will be taken up through the academy. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Chief Beck, I know you have a lot to attend to. If you wish to uh, go ahead and take off, we'll, we appreciate your being here, and uh, or you can stay if you wish. Well, thank you very much, Councilman. I got a couple of minutes, uh, so maybe I can stay a little bit longer. Uh, I would just want to add this one one piece. <clears throat> what what you have before you is going to be is going to go nationwide. This will be a model for uh, the rest of the country on how to deal with gang violence. And this is this, you know, the, the city of Los Angeles, I know you've all heard me say this before, has become so famous for exporting the problem throughout the nation and the world that this is our opportunity to be famous for exporting a solution. And and I, I just strongly urge this committee to to think about who you want to represent you, me, the city of Los Angeles in this effort. And and I think it's pretty clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I will turn the matter over first to Council Member Cardenas, having chaired the subcommittee. And uh, as it uh, relates to the uh, advisory committee, I will, uh, with his uh, approval, appoint him to represent this committee on that com uh, advisory committee, if that's okay with you. Sure, I, I would and, accept that responsibility. All right, great, very good. And with that, uh, Mr. Cardenas. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, let the, the committee chairman know and, and the chief know that I don't have any specific questions for you, Chief. Uh, I. I respect your involvement in this process and your practical uh, experience and, and your willingness to speak on the record to intervention and how important it is to all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I don't, I don't want to, if anybody has questions for the chief, Mr. Chairman, if they could go first. That way the chief can leave when he has to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, uh, thank you, chief. Thank you, folks, for all your hard work. Chief, when, uh, when we look at, at where we're at in terms of a city and and the level of, um, lack of a better word, uh, uh, structure. Uh, the structure that you see evolving from these efforts. Uh, I know we have a long way to go. That I understand. And in one of my, our committee hearings, I spoke about a big mistake I made in 10 years ago where we actually had the officers and the gang intervention in one room and how tense and how uh, uncomfortable that was, the lack of trust. And I know we've moved uh, quite a bit from that point till now. But the program as you've seen it and the way it's been handled to the RFP process, um, do you feel it's, it's giving us enough footing where 
the city is finally recognizing uh, the gravity of the situation and where it can no longer be a a uh, can I say this a uh, public relations effort where it's a feel good session but we're not getting to to the structural issues of our of our neighborhoods and our policing and our and and, and the basic institutions that that have allowed this to fester uh, do you think this RFP and the way we're approaching it is it going in the direction that you wanted to see and and you're exactly on on point councilman and thank you for the question the, this RFP will be the basis upon which we can build intervention in the city of Los Angeles this RFP will allow us to not only bring stability to intervention but bring oversight bring uh, standards uh, bring a, a, a easily discernible uh, recognition piece uh, bring police officers on board so that the, the piece that you saw ten years ago doesn't reoccur you know it, it has all the and I've been as you, as you all know I've been a, a champion of intervention for a number of years now this has all the pieces that have been missing and and that's why I support it this will be this will be the platform upon which we can build a strong intervention program that the city can be proud of uh, you know it, it um, you know when you deal with gang issues it's always it's always fraught with uh, uh, with peril but you know I, I truly believe in this and I and I believe that the people that have been selected understand the need uh, to protect the city and to, to protect it through this academy is there one element that stands out above others that you see facilitates this level of uh, coordination and or communication well I, I think that the uh, the structure as uh, Guillermo talked about uh, so eloquently the structure of the, not only the program but of the uh, of the discipline of intervention that will be added uh, here I, I think that's what you know on, we, on the ground it works right now I mean you know when Chief Gannon or I call P or any of the other people that are back here and and we need some help they show up they work uh, you know they create peace they dispel rumors they do what intervention does uh, and and we're very, and it's been successful but this takes it this takes it to the next level this makes them you know this makes them not only uh, accountable but uh, institutionalizes them which which is really important because uh, right now you know you have a lot of people that are working out of the goodness of their hearts you know trying to do the right thing and we need to we need to give them the ability to make this sort of their career and that's part of what this does thank you chief yeah, Chief, I respect you greatly, as you know, and, and uh, Chief Gannon. I have not worked in that community for a long, long time, but I know the gang problem has continued for too many years. But I, I know this one part of this project, the reentry, is not included. So while we have the folks that get in trouble, we have the intervention, we don't have that reentry into a job market. How do we plug that gap? It's nice to quell the violence. But so it doesn't occur again and again. Where do we bring in that job market so they can get employed and go on the right track instead of that continuing gang activity? And reentry is a huge, a huge. It's one of the four pillars of uh, of our gang uh, violence uh, strategy. Um, it's, but not, it's not part of this. No, it's not part of this. But it but it is extremely important. And and there, I'm sure that there. I'm sure Guillermo can talk about how there will be some reentry spillover here in the in the case-based intervention piece, but it, that's not the primary goal of this particular uh, of this particular issue. But it's very important, and it's something that the city needs to deal with. And I know that you, I've heard you talk about it. You've heard me talk about it. We all know how important reentry is going to be, especially with the looming release, you know, from the from the uh, state prisons. I mean, this is going to be a huge issue. So we have to deal with this on another through another vehicle. Is there something else? that approaching where that will occur once we do the intervention and then obviously prevention intervention suppression the reentry where they come back to the community the old friends are there they take up where they left off they get rearrested goes through the cycle again oh, door. where is that Guillermo where is that aspect of giving them some kind of a opportunity and I totally support where you're going with this. Yes. I'm looking at that other level that hopefully should be intertwined with it. I don't the re see it. The reentry piece, sir, we are currently evaluating. Um, we're looking at regional strategies and applying for funding to develop those kinds of programs. So that's moving forward. 
enough. Yeah, it is moving forward, yeah. sir. And we have a couple of good programs in the city, okay. but not enough. Exactly. If you don't mind, uh, I'd like to help answer that question. Uh, the bottom line is the, it was about two and a half years ago under this particular governor, um, they started to fund in a small, on a small scale some reentry funds, and they gave some grants. Some grants were actually awarded in and around the city of Los Angeles. But again, as the chief just mentioned and Guillermo uh, just mentioned as well, it's about applying for potential funds. Right now, the city of Los Angeles doesn't have any more funds that we've been able to identify to add to our intervention efforts. But we did get a, a little ray of light when the state stated that they were going to actually give grants for reentry. They did give a modicum of grants for reentry. But everybody involved in this process knows that reentry is something that is barely being touched. But the, the problem with reentry is that we just don't have the funds locally, and the state funds that were actually put out were, were minimal. But it's a start. So the answer to that is reentry is something that's all on our minds. Reentry is something that we all understand. Reentry is something that we know is a key component. But unfortunately, we don't have the resources today to actually implement a lot of reentry right now. Will that frustrate this program with the lack of reentry? No. There, I mean, it. Uh, we need to go down the reentry path. The, but but the intervention can stand on its own. I mean, the whole package is the best. But but we have to recognize that some of these things. Can be raised in compartments, but then and then brought together as they as they mature, and uh, so it would be better if we had a reentry piece, a similar program, but they don't have to be the same program. And I, and I think that the training is specific to intervention and 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 uh, and the officers, and, and so I think this can stand alone as it is. But also, if what what's important to understand is that when it comes to prong one and prong two, as now we've defined and adopted in the city of Los Angeles, like no other community in in, in the country, a part of that is that, uh, for example, Homeboy Industries is, is is one example where they actually help people with job uh, training. They actually help try to help place people with potential employers that actually are willing to look at these individuals and go ahead and interview them and hire them, and they do have some success. But that's that's an example of how intervention touches on that. But there's something that, that came to mind, and, and I'm sure Council Member Reyes would be interested in this as well. In in these courses, one of the things that could be taught to these individuals is their rights once they're back out on the street, so that they do not experience uh, illegal um, um, uh, ex uh, practices when it comes to getting a job. Yes, many of them have a felony record, et cetera, but it does not mean that they don't have any rights when mm -hmm. they go apply for a job. So perhaps what could be incorporated in not so much the practical aspect of the, the street interventionists, but also to educate the interventionists is to help these young, uh, these people who are back out on the streets, how to understand their rights and where they can actually go to actually, uh, or give handouts, et cetera, that they could actually give Correct. to people who are back out on the street. That's part of reentry, but intervention touches many of these individuals, so that's a perfect point where if people are going to want to get a job, it's not enough for them to think that when they walk into a place and they just outright say, oh, you have a felony, and they close the process and say, we can't even interview you. That's not a legal statement. That's To a certain degree, that's a prerogative of an employer, but people should know their rights when it comes to wanting to get a job. Sir, if, if I may add that uh, that's an excellent suggestion. If you look at the, the curriculum development component of this, there is the basic course that intervention workers will be required to take to get certification, and that's about 100 and between 100 and 150 hours to gain the basic certification. In order to maintain that certification, there would be two continuing education models that each intervention worker will have to take to retain that certification. And it may very well be that one of the um, the modules get, that gets developed through the advi the you know the suggestion of the advisory committee is precisely what you're talking about. So this leaves it open for actually developing multiple areas of training as part of this continuing education concept. Um, in every profession, you have to go through continuing tra continuous training, and the intervention profession is exactly the same. So that's a great suggestion. Council okay. members, thank you very much for your for your interest and commitment to this. Thank you, thank you, thank you Chief. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make sure we got the questions out of the way for the Chief before he leaves. But I'm sure Gannon's going to be glued to his chair until we're done. <laughs> right? Okay. Thank you, Chief. You've been assigned.
<coughs> you've been assigned. Uh, is it Chief now? Yes, as of uh, Friday, I was uh, sworn right. in. Okay, Chief Cannon. Thank you. We used to call you Commander up until recently. That's why he's got two stars. Okay, so the stars. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I answer to a lot of different things at home. So, uh. <laughs> they know stars there. Uh, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I've been. I, I can't say enough about uh, the collaboration and the the uh, respect that I have for Mr. Cespedes. And thank you, the, sir. He's been thrown into this responsibility of being the lead person in the mayor's office. He has uh, an excess of 30 people under him that he has to uh, work with and make sure that they're doing uh, the job that they've been tasked to do. And the mayor's office has been doing a very good job. I had a, a sit down with the mayor the other day, um, uh, and we agree on most uh, of how he feels about how should we should go forward, and, and we agree together on many, many things, but we also respectfully disagree on, on some details that him and I uh, are committed to uh, working through and trying to make the best of. But I, I can't say enough about how Mr. Cespedes has been collaborative and cooperative with the suggestions <coughs> and putting up with uh, many, many hours of my office's efforts and work to uh, try to help with this process. One thing that I'd like to point out in, in the interest of time, there's many things I'd like to go over, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Um, the fact of the matter is Mr. Cespedes talked about our collaboration and cooperation, and, and I agree on the record, and I wanted to make it clear that, that he's absolutely right. He's not overstating that at all. But at the same time, within this process, certain things are within the mayor's office's purview, and it should be that way. But one of the things that I'd like to point out that doesn't sit well with me is the fact that um, when I chaired the, the ad hoc committee and there were hundreds and hundreds of hours of testimony and collaboration and work from the mayor's office, from intervention workers, from the county different departments and many, many uh, organizations and individuals who are very involved in these matters, we also had many hours of understanding and the mayor's office walking us through uh, the processes. And this is one of the process, this is a process that I'm very surprised and it doesn't sit well with me that a site visit was not done. For example, site visits have been done by the city of Los Angeles by many departments uh, on many occasions. For example, just recently, there were organizations that were applying for a million dollars a year of funding um, to have community-based uh, organizations provide services throughout many of our, our districts. And site visits were done, yet at the same time, some of those proposals didn't have a site to visit. Yet at the same time, they figured out a way and a process for them to actually fairly evaluate what people had on paper and said that what they would do once they had a site and also what sure. organizations actually were doing that actually had practical sites at the time. In this particular case, when it comes to the advancement project and when it comes to a better LA, one of the other proposers, um, the advancement project doesn't necessarily have uh, the sites to visit as does a better LA. And also, the advancement project has actually given courses uh, that could actually be evaluated as well, practical courses and, and looking at their data and experience of the courses that they provided and yet at the same time, Better LA could, would have that to, to look at as well by the evaluating committee. Yet at this time, the evaluating committee, and as you outlined very clearly, Guillermo, what the mayor's office internal guidelines or mechanisms or triggers are when you decide to go out to the community and actually visit Sorry. sites. So I was a bit surprised, and it doesn't sit well with me, that site visits were not done in this particular case. And it was also mentioned by you, Mr. Cespedes, a few minutes ago to this committee that looking at the scores prior to deciding whether or not to go out to a site visit seemed to have an influence on determining whether or not you were going to go to site visit? No, no, sir. I, I like to um, site visits in all of the cases that we have made site visits have been recommended and asked for by the review panel. Our office asked the review panel, are there questions that you have about these ratings? If the scores are ex extremely close, 
irregardless of what the review panel says, we demand a site visit. In this particular case, and as Commander Gannon will point out, there was no question, no desire on part of the review panel to make a site visit. That's point number one. Point number two is that it's difficult to make a site visit to a non to an entity that is not up and running. Now, there are components that are up and running. For example, the there is no advisory committee, there is no uh, curriculum committee, there is no st professional standards board. Those components are perhaps even more important than the actual class taking place. The curriculum itself, evaluating a curriculum that had been done, um, the advisory committee will have every opportunity to evaluate curriculum. This curriculum, the the responsibility for, for curriculum development is within the contract. So we will all have a responsibility and an, um, an opportunity to evaluate the curriculum. So the side visits were not made for multiple reasons. One, the, uh, the review panel did not ask for it. Two, we have this issue of there isn't an exist existing platform that, that uh, resembles this. There are components. And three, once those decisions have been made that the panel didn't ask for a, re for a site visit, our office looked at the scores. And based on that decision, on, on all that information, a site visit was not made. Uh, but the, the process is appropriate. And then finally, site visits are really, um, you know, at the discretion of the mayor's office. They're not demanded. Uh, of course, we want to make site visits to make sure that we're getting the best product. But in this particular case, it was not necessary. It was a very clear decision as to which um, organizational plan, which curriculum development plan, which professional standards board plan, um, received the highest score. And I fully and 100% support that. Um, okay. So then, then I have this question for you. Um, when it comes to, can you describe for this committee in, in a broad sense, which are the main components of, of a curriculum that that are are going to be taught, and is there is there a basic aspect of the practical that is being taught and the theoretical? There is a um, a direct practice component. There is a personal development component, and these were ranked by multiple practitioners as to which were more most important. There is a concrete task component, and I will explain why, why there are all these different categories. Um, there is a broader policy issues component. Um, these categories were developed for the following reason. It is rare. Um, there are issues with practice in the field with intervention workers. But, you know, for the most part, there are very, they, we do have a fairly elite group, not a large group, but a very elite group of intervention workers that are very grounded in practice. The issue of personal development, generally, when there is an issue with an intervention worker, is not about the practice. So there is a balance here between direct practice, personal development, concrete tasks, very simple things like filing reports, uh, contract compliance, all of those things are important. Um, very often misinformation about RFPs, funding streams, um, city policies create conflict on the streets. So it is important for intervention workers to understand funding streams, RFPs, etc. Um, so yes, it is primarily practice, personal development, and all, all those hours are broken down into the curriculum. And if you look, I'm sure that you, you've seen that in the advancement project curriculum, I mean proposal, those hours are broken down. Okay, uh, let, let me be more specific. Um, when it comes to certain aspects of what 
is expected of intervention workers, especially those intervention workers who are going to be doing prong one work, actually going to be out on the streets perhaps at 2 o'clock in the morning dealing Correct. with people, Correct, sir. asking them to put down their guns, et cetera. I mean, literally dealing in, in a moment of heated passion and, and perhaps uh, violent that most people would think is pretty eminent. Um, for example, uh, for example, seize fire maintenance is part of uh, my understanding of what it's supposed to be brought across and understood by some individuals, interventionists, conflict resolution, emergency room-based intervention, police, fire, emergency medical technician, and uh, coroner protocols, license to operate, which is something particular. Uh, that means a lot of things, but in this particular case, license to operate by an intervention worker. Those kinds of aspects. Is, is the advancement project today ready, willing, and able to provide the best service possible to this particular community, for this particular RFP, for this particular work, or is a better LA better prepared today to provide those aspects that I just outlined? I believe that the faculty that has been outlined as part of the advancement project, um, every category that you mentioned and all those 13 faculty members are here, immediately able to provide that information now no, no, I didn't ask you best I, I said best prepared if you had I believe that there are I, I believe that there are best prepared so better than than better at knowledge. this point yes I think that so they're better prepared to implement I, that correct practical. sir I bel you've asked me my opinion and yeah, I've answered absolutely. it absolutely but I just want to be very clear that you understand exactly what my question is what you're saying is advancement project today as you understand it correct is sir ready and able to provide a better course to the individuals that need to understand and learn that than a better LA is today. I believe that, sir. What what gives you that understanding well, today? Based on the faculty that that are listed here. Has Advancement Project actually proven to actually provide that service in those courses to date? Um Yes, they did through, and and that was funded through the Weingart Foundation, and they can speak to that how they developed this curriculum, the process that they went through, the curriculum that has been functioning over 18 months, developing exactly what you're talking about. So, yes, they can, um, and some of that faculty is here. No, 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 Guillermo, that's why I'm choosing my words carefully, and and you're a very intelligent man, and I've had many conversations with you. And I just want to make sure that you understand exactly what I'm what I'm asking you to state, and you're choosing to answer my question. Thank you very much. And that is not whether they can, whether or not they do today. They do not have the program up and running today, sir. Does That's Better LA have that aspect of the program? They have a component of that program. That's my point. I'm talking to that component. They have a component. I'm not talking about the theory. No, no, no. no. They have a component of that program. Yes. They don't have all of the other platforms that sure, are necessary exactly. as I'm part of this. I'm not talking about all the other ones. I'm talking about that component. Correct. They do. Are you telling me that of that component, Advancement Project is better prepared to provide that service, those courses, because this is a service. Correct. Those courses today than a better LA. Based on the plan that has been formulated and presented and evaluated, it is the mayor's office, it is my evaluation that this is the best platform to move forward with. Um, are they going to? Are we going to need to incorporate other elements to it with curriculum development and with practice? That would always be the case. The well, direct, the direct practice, practice components that you have outlined can be serviced by the advancement project. We have made a choice based on what was presented, the information that we have what is available and the practitioners yes they can they will need a period you know the, the first class will start in March but yes they are capable of providing those services Councilman yeah. to help answer that question I, I've had an opportunity not only to work with most of the um, faculty um, for both um, Better LA's proposal and for um, APs and, and on the AP proposal on, on the piece that you're talking about the license to operate the hospital room uh, strategies and those types of things the AP has had a training program that I attended or I participated in I wasn't there every single day mm -hmm. but I was there on a couple of different occasions and they have 
um, very, very, very good instructors on those on those issues. When you when you talk about hospital uh, protocols at, at, for gangs, at you talking about Michael Garcia out of um, a white memorial. White memorial. Um, if you're talking about a license to operate, um, you're talking about Howard Euler from uh, um, from Toberman Settlement House, who for 30 years has pioneered this entire type of type of effort that are connected with uh, with AP. Those individuals who have taught by themselves in many cases have come together with AP in previous training um, to provide those. Um, uh, the, that type of training. So, if you're asking whether or not that capability is up and running and, and has it has it been used, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, but but what I, what I'm getting at here is, Mr. Cespedes, in this process, does the mayor's office have the ability and the authority to contract with more than one entity directly to make sure that we get the maximum and the best effort and the best results from the entire process. Yes, it is at the, at the discretion of the mayor's office to do that. And, and, and why did you choose not to do that and choose to just go with one particular they, entity? Well, subcontracting, sir, is a fairly um, complex process that requires not just philosophical and service delivery agreement, but also the ability to actually function within the same structure. In this particular case, or function under the same structure, in this particular case, we feel very strongly that it's, it is counterproductive to subcontract. I'm we, sorry, what? We feel that it's counterproductive to subcontract. What are you referring to, counterproductive to subcontract? Well, what are you thinking of when okay, you say that? Counterproductive in the sense that there, there have been um, we went through a process of about a five-month um, curriculum development sets of meetings to come up with an ability to bring everyone that teaches together. That process, as you very well know, was not productive. We went to an RFP so that we could get an academy up and running. Mm -hmm. The relationships between the various segments um, that are teaching, it is not in the best interest of the city to try to bring those relationships together at this point to try to get this academy up and running. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, other faculty people that could enhance this, but given the faculty that is presented and the overall evaluation of what's going on in the city, it is in the best interest of the city to move forward with this particular plan. So, are, so basically what you're saying is that, as far as you understand, should this recommendation go forward through the council process, that Advancement Project would be providing all of the courses and they would or would not be uh, contracting with a better LA for a particular aspect of the courses? The Advancement Project has the full confidence of the mayor's office to identify other faculty members that they would like to subcontract with. I think at this point it is a be in the best interest of the city not to force a subcontracting agreement um, in this particular situation, sir. Okay. Just for the record, I'm not asking you to force Advancement Project to subcontract with somebody. But what I am asking of you is, in the interest of the lives of the people that we're trying to save, in interest of the interventionists out there today and the interventionists of the future, what is pre precluding your office from recommending that a certain aspect of the courses, especially when it comes to those, as I outlined earlier, those very important components that in some cases actually are life and death, for not only for the people in the I street, agree with you, but sir. for the intervention. That I fully agree with you. That's what, precisely what's what... keeping the mayor's office from contracting directly with the better LA for the Precisely courses. for those reasons, sir, that right now... State those. Okay, please. the reasons are this. In the interest of the cities, um, the ability to build an academy that can function and deliver the services, at this particular point in time, it is in the best interest of the city to contract with these faculty members, as the director of the Office of Gang Reduction, I fully support that. That evaluation has been done by a committee. We have reviewed it. We have had dialogue. Now, in the future, that may be different. 
But right now, I do not believe that that is in the best interest of the development of this academy. To, for, for the same reasons that you're talking about, protecting lives, being able to work together, being able to effectively impact what needs to be done. Now, those reasons, I, you know, without getting into, you know, more detail, it's our evaluation to make, and I'm fully confident that this is the best way to move forward. Well, I, I appreciate your willingness to restate that, but I'm still not convinced that a better LA should not be contracted. Forget about subcontracting directly with the mayor's office on particular courses that they seem to have a better mastery of well, no, than that's, the advancement. That, no, that, that is a subjective evaluation, sir. I think that what I'm suggesting to you is that one of the problems or one of the, the important elements of this academy is a clear line of accountability, a clear line of management, a clear line of being able to hold people accountable, organizations accountable for all of this. It is clear that the relationship that we tried to forge before was not functional. And to do it, to break up the philosophical, practical, and organizational elements of the RFP gets us back to what we started from. Well, it, I, I don't agree with that because what, what I'm talking about right now I, is... I, I agree. Now, the, what, what the, the, and forgive me, members, but this is, this, it really is life and death. So it, it's really important to Mr. Cespedes, and, and I respect the fact that he does understand how important this is. I believe that, that we worked a lot together to get to this point. So I, right. I want to clarify, a lot of this is, is wonderful, good work, but I have contention with one particular aspect. I understand. And that is going back to what you talked about earlier about, tr about trying to bring different entities together so that they could collaboratively pull together what this academy should look like so that all aspects of the academy will be provided to the potential intervention workers, organizations, and the community. But in that particular effort, that was abandoned, and rightfully so abandoned, and we agreed that unfortunately it fell apart. Correct. One of the aspects that was not part of that effort and is not part of this effort today is the fact that the mayor's office would be willing and able to be that entity that makes sure that everybody is held accountable as independent separate parties that are contracted directly with the city. And you're choosing you're choosing with full confidence, as you keep saying, with full confidence to go forward and only contract directly with one particular entity. At this point, I believe instead of both. Correct, sir. Why is that that you're not willing to contract directly with sir, the LA? Because I believe it will fragment the overall structure of the organization. I think, as you very well Wait, know, what organization? The organization in the of, mayor's office, the organization on the streets, the organization of the training platform. The training platform needs to be. Um, the curriculum needs to be cohesive, the philosophy, philosophical approach needs to be cohesive, the ability to work together needs to be cohesive, it needs to be for the time being under one direct line of management and accountability. That is what we have based this evaluation on, uh, this decision on, evaluating that. We feel that having that direct management accountability line with one entity, with the mayor's office, it is the most productive way to move forward. I don't know if there's some other things that you would like to add to that, Commander, but... No, I, I, I agree with uh, Guillermo. Um, it, is, it is hard in any organization to have, to, to run it where you have multiple people with different philosophies on how something should be done to um, to come together it's really I think the city's been forced into this into this RFP should we continue to to move in a direction where you get as much interaction and assistance from people who are in the field and doing the work absolutely should this RFP stop the process of a better LA and and everybody else from coming together and trying to work no. together towards a better intervention process I, I think that it it should not, yeah. that each of those should come together. It's difficult for, for myself to sit up here and to, and, and to choose one over the other when yes. I have so much respect for all of them. And, but in this particular matter, in the way in which I think that the city has put this RFP out there and has made a selection, 
we should allow that selection to go through and allow the advancement project to run that uh, piece of that tr the the uh, violence and eruption academy. Uh, again, uh, Chief Gannon, I almost called you <laughs> Commander. Chief Gannon, I, I respect what you're saying and I agree with everything you just said. The only difference is I believe that the recommendation of the mayor's office right now has one compromise in it, and that compromise is too expensive for me, Mr. Cespedes, and the compromise is to pull together and have one outside contractor handle the entire process when, in fact, I believe that we have a particular contractor when it comes to a critical, critical aspect of this process that is already far and away above anybody else right now in the entire United States is right here in our midst. And the fact of the matter, Mr. Gannon, what warms my heart is, regardless of what happens with this RFP process, a better LA is going to continue their great work. Of Absolutely. course. Because they're not doing it for money. Today, they're not doing it for money. And I'm not even saying the advancement project is getting paid very much. It's $200,000 to run an academy is nothing. And we all know that. It's very understandable. So, so with all due respect to the advancement project, that is, that, that is not an issue as to whether or not anybody's in it for the money. That's not the point. But the fact of the matter is, I'm going to state for the record, colleagues, from what I understand, in the years and years of work that I put into this, both in the state legislature and on the city council, and the fact that I take this issue so personal, so personal, and I'm not talking about personal from a, an ego vantage point. I'm talking about personal when I think about the I lives understand. of the young boys and girls that are being lost at the wonderful lower rate that we have today of 200 and some homicides this year, which is a tremendous effort on behalf of everyone, the police department, the intervention community, prevention community, everybody, including the mayor's office and all the wonderful work that you've done. We still have killings going on, and we can do better. And the fact of the matter is this. The fact of the matter is this. I cannot, because of your answers, Mr. Stess, for this, I cannot agree today to vote for the recommendation coming out of the mayor's office. What I would like for you to do is to please consider the authority that you have, the authority that, that has been provided to your office to go ahead and contract directly with more than one agency on such critical matters that you exercise that right. Sir. And for you to only give us the answer that if the advancement project is the only entity that you feel comfortable contracting Sir, with today is inappropriate, Sir, it's inaccurate. I respectfully disagree with you. You have just asked me to use the authority that I have. I have to make a decision based on the information that is available to me. I have had conversations with evaluations. I've been working on this project for over a year and a half now. At this point in time, I believe that precisely for the same reasons that you talked about, I share your concern about lives. I share your concerns about what's happening on the streets. I am still on the streets. I, I do not sit in City Hall. I go, I respond to gang-related shootings, I am still in the street. I go through exactly the same level of exasperation that you go through, and we're both very passionate about it, as we've shared many times. We're simply disagreeing about what's the best way to get there. And I believe that the best way to get there is to establish this format, and then at a later point examine the issue of whether we incorporate, whether we have other people come in. I believe that is in the best interest of the city. In the, for the same reasons that you're talking about, because lives are being lost, because we need to have intervention workers better trained, for all the same passionate reasons that you and I share. We're just disagreeing on how to get there, and we believe this is the best way to get there, and that is what our office has responsibility for, that is the demand or the mandate of what I'm supposed to do, and I just simply respectfully disagree with you. It is not it's about how to get there. And I believe this is the best, most effective, quickest way to get there and have the comprehensive services that the city needs. I agree with you, Mr. Cespedes, that you pointed out that it is the quickest way to get there. No. And that I agree with you on. But whether or not this is the best solution, I cannot agree today that this is the best solution. If there's anybody out there that would like to shed some light on this to help give me at least a certain level of comfort that this recommendation is going to work to the best of our ability, and I say to the best of our ability, all of us who are vested in this, Mr. Cespedes, and you're very vested in this. So I appreciate you, you requalifying and requantifying how vested you are. I agree that you are. 
I like working with you. I believe that you are very vested and you do care. You are very thoughtful and you are very careful, but I disagree on this particular recommendation. I got a couple of questions regarding Better LA. Uh, who, where is it based and who operates it? He's on the speaker list. Are you on the speaker list? Okay. And the advancement project, where are they based and who operates that? The, they are here also, sir. Uh, where, where are they based? Their their office is on um, it's on Rampart, oh, Wilshire. Okay. On, yeah. Is Better LA based in Los Angeles also? Yes, they are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. One um, resounding fact in my mind is that everyone sees our goal fairly clearly. Yes. I think the question here is how we get there. Uh, I think time is on our side to the extent that, as Councilmember Connors have said, folks are doing this whether they're getting paid or not. And I've got the ASIC fire crew, but there's other crews out there that are making things happen. Uh, there are all different approaches. Um, my sense of hope is that in the next, hopefully, year or two, we will have more resources that I think we're bottoming out in terms of our budget and our financial uh, condition and that we can fold in and do the improvements that I think Councilman McArthur is looking for in terms of approaches and operations. This is the first time we do this. Um, it's a Herculean effort. Uh, we're talking about changing institutions and cultures. That does not happen overnight. But we got to start somewhere. Um, so I guess my question to you, Sespa, uh, this is um, because you're taking this approach now doesn't mean it can't change in the future. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That is correct, sir. Okay, so based on, on how we figure out how to melt this ice that's frozen everybody in their position, that, you know, time has a way of healing. Well, time, collaboration, dialogue, um, actually working together, all of those things need to lead to that. This, um, the issue of um, expanding the faculty of this academy, it's a long-term process. It does not mean that um, that cannot be happening happen in the future. At this moment in time, it is in the best interest of the city, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the panel, to move forward with this and consider all other options as we move through this advisory committee and get input into the academy, it is at this point in time that we I feel strongly that this is the first step. This is not all of the steps. Can can I review this, uh, Mr. Chair? Is uh, in view of Councilman Gardner's concerns, can we request a report back in six months to see how this is actually being implemented and to see how rigid or how frozen the polarities are. Yeah. And, and, and that would be very helpful, sir. And given uh, that we're telling everybody we have to come together on this, these, this, this, this uh, rigid stance is not helping anyone. It is not, sir. And this frozen state needs to melt away eventually. And then maybe in six months we have a gut check and speak to how we can start folding in these other methods, op operations, or personalities and start folding it in because the bullet has no discrimination. It's going to go where it's going to go. I fully go. agree with you, sir. And so let's understand that. Um, and in those six months, also look at the other entities that could be out there that could be working with us. I, I, I would like to make a comment about that, the other entities. And, and sir, you mentioned ABLA. I have probably, of any, or our office has probably the closest relationship in terms of collaboration. The mayor's flagship program, the Summer Night Lights program, it is a program that is done in collaboration with ABLA. There's already been dialogue of how to identify new sites that would bring about the collaboration that you both, and I agree with, needs to take place. That we need to do through direct programming. So in other words, that dialogue, that ability to try to 
what I call build a bigger bus rather than leave people off the bus, that is currently and will continue to take place as it is in the, you know, in trying to build a, a bigger bus um, in collaborating inside City Hall. So yes, that will continue to take place. So Mr. Chair, could we have that six month yeah, report we'll back? That when we get to the vote, we'll add that in. Okay, thank you. I just have one more comment on this. It, it's obviously it's troubling that this dialogue has taken this period of time when we have a proposal to move forward with a particular vendor, uh, shall we say, a contractor, is that the police department has come forward with intervention, suppression, a new environment to try and help improve the quality of life in Los Angeles, the traditional lock them up, throw away, the key doesn't work, and obviously there's a new approach. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has spent millions upon millions of dollars over the last few years on programs, and most of them haven't proven very effective. And I think what we have is uh, my colleague, Councilman Mary Cardenas, who put together this review that took, I think, over a year, started with Martin Ludlow, uh, maybe a couple years, five years, five years. <laughs> seems like a couple of years, five years. I remember when we started that, and there were a lot of people who were complaining, why are we dumping this program, why are we dumping that program? We wanted to come up with money that was going to show effectiveness. And if that's the goal, which I think is the goal of everyone, we're going to accomplish that. But it troubles me that we've got competing vendors for the money, and the very precious money. And I'm not disputing what you're saying, sir, because I haven't done the research. I respect my colleague and his comments. But the fact is, over the history of Los Angeles, we have really put in millions upon millions of dollars in programs, and it's supported administration of certain nonprofits, but really hasn't done a whole lot to improve the situation of gang violence in the city of Los Angeles, and the statistics bear that out. So I understand what we're going to do. I think the six-month idea is a, a great way to go with it. But we need to remember the history that we've spent a lot of money in the past yes, sir. and very little results. And I don't mean to uh, tarnish the mayor's reputation because it was before his time when we did that and we had a new approach to things. So I just wanted to add that to the uh, discussion regarding this particular subject. Thank you very much. We do have a couple of speakers. So, Guillermo, if I could ask you to move over one, and we'll bring up two at a time. Chief, why don't you stay there for just a moment because there's only a few speakers. And then uh, we'll finish off here. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Newman Tarwater from L.A. County Sheriff and Brian Center from a better L.A. You put the lieutenant next to the deputy chief. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I will be very quick and brief. Um, I am here, obviously, in support of the contract and having an intervention academy. Uh, we have worked very closely in collaboration with Los Angeles Police Department for some time now. Um, I am also a member of the advisory board of A Better LA, so I'm well aware of, of what's available, what isn't, and in this situation for this contract, uh, we fully support the advancement project, winning the contract, and providing a comprehensive view of training. We are also in partnership with the advancement project and the Los Angeles Police Department through our Regional Community Policing Institute on putting on the first ever eight-hour intervention course to teach law enforcement about the role of intervention workers. We've already done three courses. It's half LAPD, half sheriffs, and we will continue to put them on. So we've had uh, experience with the vendor that has won this contract. It's been very positive and has been very beneficial to our agency. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. I am uh, Brian Center, the Executive Director of A Better LA. We um, uh, fund about 40 gang intervention workers uh, throughout South L.A. <clears throat> and have partnered with Maximum Force Enterprises and Akil Bashir to create a training institute that's ongoing. And we're obviously big fans of his. think he does great work. And, um, uh, and thank you, Councilman, for your passion and, and interest in all of this. We're also big fans of the Advancement Project and think they do great work uh, and are I uh, think they will do a, a great job uh, with this project and really are supportive of this moving forward. Uh, we're, as some people mentioned, we're going to be doing our work anyway uh, out in the community. We're going to be training people not only through Akil's thing, but uh, we have personal development, self-growth, and, and uh, it's only going to make sense for us to come together in some way and coordinate and collaborate, and uh, uh, including around training issues. Uh, but I don't think we're going to 
be able to discuss those details until we get this portion moving forward because it's we've been talking about it forever we've been trying to figure out how to do it in a different way and we a lot of smart people haven't figured it out so this seems like the best way to move things forward at this time let this academy get up and running let the details be worked out and we are very committed to to continuing to explore ways to to incorporate all the best that we have to offer in LA and and like I said we'll continue to do it regardless and we are privately funded and we're having a fundraiser on February 20th with Will Ferrell so you guys can all come and we'll have a little bit more money for our portion of the training but so I fully support this thing moving forward I think it's really important that we get it going thank you very much Brian where's the fundraiser the info on that put that out all right Will Ferrell and Jack Black will do a comedy show at the Nokia Theater on February 20th. This is a shameless promotion right here. <laughs> That's right. February 20th. February 20th. Tickets on sale at Ticketmaster. Funding goes to help this cause. Thank you. Also, Mr. Chairman, I think it's important from a legal vantage point to mention that it's a not-for-profit fundraiser. Yeah, it's not a political fundraiser at all for those people who are listening. Uh, they were talking about a 501c3, correct? Yes. yes. And my favorite coach will be there as well, right? <laughs> and Will Ferrell will be there. Brian Johnson and uh, Regina Nordahl. Good morning. I'll be brief. Um, I'm Regina Nordahl. I'm the Associate Dean in the School of Policy Planning and Development at the University of Southern California. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Cherry Short, who's the Assistant Dean in the School of Social Work. Together, we are the educational partners with the Advancement Project on this very important uh, gang intervention initiative. So I'm here in support of the advancement project to let you know that we will be working with them to make sure that the curriculum is challenging and meets the needs of the um, people who will be attending. It will, we will make sure that we're able to establish uh, benchmarks that will address all of their needs so that when they complete the program, you can be certified that they're up for the task for which They'll be performing. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Brian Johnston. I'm an emergency physician. I practice at White Memorial. I've been there since 1975. Um, I'm the medical director of the department and chair of the department. In uh, on October 12, 1992, our department was shot up, uh, involved in some some gang violence, and uh, we had a quandary. We had to decide how to deal with that. And we dealt with it in a number of different ways. Uh, we did some fairly conventional things, increasing our security surveillance cameras, uh, putting up baffles and, and, uh, and walls to prevent anybody from attacking us again. Uh, but it was pretty clear that our department and our hospital would fail if it was attacked again, because people would not feel safe coming there. And we responded in addition to the traditional things by bringing a gang worker into the department to work with gang members when they came in, um, not just in the emergency department, but also in maternity, because we believe that when people have been shot, uh, it's a teachable moment. And uh, when people have a baby, it's a teachable moment. And the idea was to uh, approach uh, gang members uh, and their families uh, in this moment of crisis to see if we could get them into a, a healthier um, lifestyle. Um, we have been doing this since 1992, and we think it's a great success. Um, our gang worker is there every day and is well regarded in the community and makes us all safer. Uh, this gang worker knows the community, and the community knows the gang worker, and he has uh, a lot of credibility uh, on, the, on the street and now in the hospital. And he has taught us a great deal. Uh, he has uh, allowed gang members to come in with a much um, much greater sense of comfort and acceptance. Uh, they are often frightened, 
they're often hostile. They feel that uh, the world that they deal with is not uh, 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 safe for them. Uh, our gang worker works with security, and uh, he works with the community. And we think the result of this has been uh, a safer community and a safer hospital. Uh, I will not tell you that this is a model that, w that will work in every hospital. But I do know that it works in our hospital. And I'm delighted uh, that, that the Advancement Project is including this uh, in their program. And we fully support it. Uh, I've met with, with Connie Rice, and, and I've, I've met with uh, other people involved in this, in this project. And I'm convinced that they are sincere in their efforts, and I urge you to support this proposal. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Short, for also being with us today. Melvin Haver will be the last speaker. Good morning. I have a few statements uh, to make. I know my time is limited. First of all, I'd just like to say that I beg to differ with a few opinions that were stated earlier. When it comes to doing gang intervention work in the city of Los Angeles, I don't think that anybody in this room takes this more serious than the group that has been assembled to provide this work. This group, please stand up so you can be represented. <laughs> As it relates to doing hardcore gang intervention in the city, nine times out of ten, these individuals standing before you will be called upon to do the work. Not only do we train, but we're in the trenches working on ceasefires, peace mediation, conflict resolution, and also professionalizing this work that we provide in the city. It's no doubt in my mind that this group represents north, south, east, and west, but on top of that, a more critical dynamic, which is black and brown. This dynamic is critical to the city because of the issues that affect the city of Los Angeles. And if you don't include the black and brown dynamic in the training and in the fabric of this work, then you lose out on being a full, please forgive me, I'm a little emotional, but you lose out on having the full fabric of this work being represented. Um, I represent my agency. I'm the director, co-director of Venice 2000 Helper Foundation. We have three grid contracts, but we also represent outside of the grid. And I want to just speak on behalf of my colleagues that I, I don't believe that anybody else in the city of Los Angeles can do a better job than this group that's assembled. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That ends the public hearing comments. Uh, is there a motion on the floor? Motion to support the report. Support with the amendment, Mr. Yes. Reyes suggested. The like the review. I'd like to also make a second amendment, Mr. Chairman, okay. that the Independent Review Board uh, will be charged with certifying any and all training uh, that has to do with intervention that is going to be recognized by the City of Los Angeles. I'm sorry, I don't understand the amendment, sir. That the Independent Review Board that you referred to uh, earlier, um, what is the, the charge of that Intervention Review Board, basically? The Standards Review Board. Um, there's, there their role is to certify all of the, um, to set the criteria, to meet with intervention workers and certify the level of their work and their ability and to, and to uh, suggest corrective action. Okay. Now, when it comes to recognizing intervention, that somebody has gone through an intervention program, who's charged with that? Who has gone through that program? This is not a board that is set up to certify everyone unless they submit paperwork and appearance and all of that, and all that criteria will be set up. Um, that board is charged with certifying intervention workers that are under grid contract. We have about 102 workers, sir. But not the class. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So this board, so, so when somebody actually goes through a course 
and that course is going to be recognized by the city of los angeles in any fashion when it comes to whether or not that person is qualified or has been been qualified to actually serve in the capacity of an independent excuse me an intervention worker when it comes to satisfying the contracts with the city of los angeles what interaction or what interplay does this board have with that process or that responsibility that that uh... board would exactly do exactly that sir and as has been outlined in the uh... proposed plan there are currently six identified members of that board all of them are practitioners and uh... more will be added um, that board will be in direct contact with the executive committee of this program and they will dialogue about those issues so in other words that there will be full accountability to that book by that board and the mayor's office will oversee it so then my my point go ahead i'm sorry i think mildred lopez just helped me with that she, but, you're asking are you asking if we're willing to recognize other academies other yes. It is the goal of the mayor's office to be able to expand the pool of intervention workers throughout the city, whether they were trained at the Pat Brown Institute, whether they were trained at Maximum Forces, whether they were, wherever they were trained. This particular proposal puts forth a, a system for certifying intervention workers. They go through this academy, um, and other intervention workers may, in fact, and should be encouraged to to work through the academy to become certified if they want if they need to become certified by the city so basically what what I, I think you and I are on the same page we want to clarify for the edification of the members of this committee and the people who are listening and that is that so what we're talking about today is a subset of what the mayor's office uh, and the the certifying board is willing to recognize as credible training that is relevant to the intervention work that we expect people to do That's, I, so this is a this is technically a subset of what the mayor's office is willing to recognize like you just mentioned there have been the pat brown institute in the past correct there, there is in fact maximum force enterprises that continues regardless of what happens today there will be a very um we need to define a grandfather clause and that's the way I refer to it. I no um, offense to any of the intervention workers, but a grandfather clause to figure out. I think you and I both know that there are excellently, you call them battle tested, I call them very experienced intervention workers on the streets. It is the role of this academy, whether you're contracted by the grid or not, to be able to put forth criteria to be able to do that. To have a grandfather clause for those intervention workers that have been doing the work, and to be able to evaluate the completion or the the ready for the field level of those intervention workers that just go through the basic course. So, so basically, what we're discussing today does not preclude the mayor's office from being willing and able to recognize other uh, uh, other efforts in in the training and or practical uh, knowledge of, of workers it does not preclude that what it does involve is going through the particular process that the mayor's office has set up which mm -hmm. does not just include this academy it includes drug testing it includes background checks etc okay and perhaps other training that is well recognized by the mayor's office I, I, I don't know what you can you be more specific sir what I, what I mean is should should the advancement project have certain courses and other training go on in our midst in the community or what have you if an intervention organization has some intervention workers that have perhaps other certificates and other training in addition to and or what is going on with the advancement project based on the proposal you have before us all of those things can or would be taken into account when it comes to recognizing people's efforts and their yes, training sir. and their expertise yes sir Correct? yes okay. sir our goal is to expand the number of intervention workers, whether they're funded by the city, they are funded privately. Um, clearly, we do not have enough intervention workers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a training platform that would set forth some criteria for that, and um, and it is my hope that yes, that 
whether they have gone through Pat Brown or Maximum Force, that, that there is a vehicle that is inclusive for um, citywide for city certification. Okay. All right. Thank you. And and also one one thing that I I must say on the record, uh, and then I have a last question for Mr. Sess for this. Um, the uh, Chief Beck who's very, very well versed on these matters or what have you. I, I agree with what he said that we need to make sure that this professionalism amongst intervention workers go beyond the city and that, that as many communities be fortified with these kinds of in dedicated individuals as possible. Yet at the same time, it's scary to me that if anybody tries to advance that across the country anytime soon before, as you described many times in this discussion, Mr. Cespedes, we are on a growing stage. We, we are, sir. have a lot to learn. We have a lot more to implement yes, before sir. we have even this academy come to the point where we know it has grown to the to the degree that, that it is better tomorrow than it is today. So it, it's scary to me to think that if anybody thinks that they're going to go ahead and take this particular model and grow it across the country sometime in 2010, for example, that's a little scary to me. We're far, far away from that uh, because it's a very dangerous thing for people to assume that this can be duplicated like a course maybe at USC can be duplicated at NYU or what have you. That's different. This is, has a lot to do with the practical uh, aspects of what goes on in the streets, and it is life and death. My last point is this, uh, Mr. Cespedes, I'm hoping that you can clarify something because I think one of the intervention workers who spoke here spoke much of the truth. I have a feeling that that person or there might be people in this room that might get the impression that after the dialogue that Mr. Cespedes and I had for quite some time in this committee, that I do not have respect for intervention workers or that I'm lacking in some kind of understanding of what real inter intervention work is. Do you, do you think that I have a lacking of that, Mr. Cespedes? Sir, I think that since I took office, I have been um, very, um, I probably have spent more time with you than any other council member, dialoguing about policy, dialoguing about the work that you have done before, um, figuring out ways to build on the work that has been done before, not just by you, but by other um, other folks. So, yes, I do believe you have a full understanding of intervention work, and and I think that you know my collaboration with you will continue in figuring out how to blend policy and practice. Um, and um, probably your scheduler will. <laughs> yes, sir. I do believe that you have that understanding. Thank you. <laughs> You're beginning to sound like a politician. <laughs> I mean, you sound like a politician. That's dangerous. <laughs> and for the committee report, we will assent to the fact that Mr. Cardenas knows a lot about it. So, that being the case, the motion is uh, approved. Go forward with the committee. Recommendation to council. Thank you very much for the lengthy discussion today. We appreciate it very much. And we will now go back to item number five, or excuse me, item number special one. Number two. How about item two? Oh, he said special one. Oh, special one? Special one. Special one. Sorry about that. Special one, see a report relative to Los Angeles Police hey. Department hiring and attrition triggers. Uh, Would you please take your conversations outside so we can continue the meeting? I know it's Miss, is that Chief McCarthy still here? Sergio Leone film. There she is. Now here comes another yeah. three star. Hey. We're seeing stars today. Yeah. And Next no time use your use your pepper spray to get through the crowd. <laughs> morning, Chief. Good morning. This is Sandy Joe MacArthur from the department. Jason Clean with the CAO. Okay. Um, so we're here today to talk about the formula that we put together. Um, the formula was built on the following parameters that we're going to hire a class of 21 as adopted by the council last Wednesday. Um, we're going to revise the attrition projections that were originally adopted down to 66% of what they were listed as. Um, each class will be determined 
based on the projected deployment in the pay period for which a class would is currently scheduled to begin and the point of the class would catch would be to catch us back up to the nine nine six three and then if it would take less than twenty officers to catch us up to nine nine six three we would defer the class and we would hire those officers in a future class and at uh, the end of the day we finished 2009-10 at 9963, which is what was originally adopted. Chief? Uh, we met on several occasions regarding this, and we believe that this is a very good um, formula that we ultimately will be able to use through 2010-11 as well, because it really does match almost one for one the attrition rate. It, it really minimizes the guessing in it, and it maximizes the actuals. And we think it will be a good way for us to move forward next year as well. Excuse me, just a clarification, Mr. Chairman. Chief, what's your name again? Sandy Jo MacArthur. Okay. M-A-C-A-R-T-H-U-R. She's an assistant. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what I noticed, three stripes, but I don't know. Oh, three stars. Uh, three, three stars, stars yes. yes. Walk a little taller today. And, and I, I, uh, I don't think we've, we've dialogued before. No, I have with some of your folks, but you personally weren't available when I went over and met. So we'll, I'm going to get on your calendar. Absolutely. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. I will vouch for her profession. I don't know that. That's a, that's <laughs> she could probably do without that. Yeah. It's work well How about the city attorney? She could vouch. <laughs> <laughs> so, does, does this uh, modify our original monthly joint meeting? Yeah, I think what it does is it, it takes away the need for probably the meeting because it set a formula, which is what we were. The end result was we really wanted a system that we all agreed on. So we will get a monthly report. We will get a written report. Yes. And hopefully then we will see how well it works and mm -hmm. then we can look at moving forward to the, the 2010-11 year. What, what's the best documented number of officers that we have based on today if, if, if the most accurate snapshot clo as close to today as possible? Uh, what we, the best way to look at it is to, to look first at our payroll and who is actually on payroll and that was some of the discussions we had when you were out of town. So we look at what's on our payroll and then because the payroll is uh, four to six weeks behind, then we actually look at how many people have come in and retired between now and then. But we want to separate those numbers so we're as, as factual as possible and we're not, that has always been the pa problem in the past. The department's used one set of numbers and everybody else has used another. So we are committed to looking at this every four weeks or every two weeks and we're going to be working closely with the CAO and the CLA so that they know exactly our numbers as well. And that will start to help us get away from guessing about what attrition is going to be and really working more with the actual numbers. And as you can see in the deployment plan, we have the class in January and right now it looks like we won't have the February class based on the projected numbers but we would reconfigure the numbers to see where we're at. And then... Does position control still exist? Yes, it does. It is under me now. Do they still have that chalkboard where they list the daily tally? We actually... Um, here, I'll let Gloria Gruby. Uh, she's my commanding officer in charge of personnel, so she, I'll let her answer that. I remember that uh, every day the number would the change. Plastics. <laughs> Gloria Gruby. I'm the new commanding officer at personnel group. I'll be uh, working for Chief MacArthur. Position control section does still exist. There are new systems in place, and as the chief mentioned, we are going to be working very closely with the CAO, the CLA, and the retirement folks. And there is a lag, actually, of um, up to two months sometimes when somebody goes off a of payroll because of calculations involving disability pensions, buyouts for sick time, vacation time. There is quite a process to it, and that's what we're really trying to work very closely and carefully with them. We've had some long and lengthy meetings on how best to do this, and we think we're there, and we think that. Uh, once we have that final report, we will use um, the CAO and CLA's final report as the numbers. So if someone's burning their sick time or burning their vacation time or burning whatever time, they still show working when in reality, reality they're... Fine. Yeah, there's some, there's some anomalies like that that we're going to be looking at very carefully. And there will be another attachment to those numbers that will show um, who's actually um, part of our uh, total numbers. So as, as of today, what does the chalkboard say? There is no longer a chalkboard there. It's a whiteboard, and I oh, don't know because I haven't been there today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's okay. I know that I didn't know that it fluctuated that much, but I know that their state rate, the state rate, I know we're going to separate state rate out of here now. Correct. Yeah. You, um, you separate state rate out there. But we put the chief back in the component. Correct. Correct. 
and we do expect his recap to show his field work. Yes, we will do that. We'll do that. Good luck with that. Make sure he turns in a DFAR. A DFAR at the end of it. We're really going to try to take a close look at who's on medical leave, who's not being paid, state rate, all of those things, which we were not separating out before. Because when we look at the actual number, we'll have an actual number of what is there. And then are they going to have the categories of those in these different categories? So say we're at 10,000, but we're really at 9,000 because we've got 1,000 here, there, and everywhere. Correct. Military leave and you name it. We will show you those numbers. We will have those numbers, and we'll be working very closely with all the city entities to all be on the, to have the same numbers. On a go-forward basis, the payroll spreadsheet that's in front of you is going to be modified, and it's going to include all the positions within the department. So on Friday, they had 9,982 officers on payroll who were receiving paychecks. But they still had 21 officers still in IOD positions. State rate. The state rate, correct. And then they have a number of officers out on personal leave, unpaid, military leave, unpaid. That's all going to be reflected in the spreadsheet next year. Okay. On a go-forward basis, we're trying to work it out so that when we add those people back into the payroll spreadsheet, there's not a cost attributed to them because they're not getting paid by the city, so there shouldn't be a cost. But they will be reflected here so that everybody is looking at the same set of numbers so we can get to the same end point, which is either the number of officers in deployment or officers in filled positions. Excellent. Thank you. So that 9,982 was the answer to my earlier question? Yes. The nearest snapshot. Thank you. Yes. As of 1130. Well, actually, as of 1,700 on Friday. Friday. As of Friday. Not as of Sunday or Monday. Okay. As of Friday. Go ahead. Yes, please. You want to clarify something? I was going to say, the department has already expended their hiring allocation for this year. So we just want to make it clear that we're going to be dipping into the reserve fund in order to pay for all remaining classes this year. I mean, there is no way to bridge the $80.3 million deficit that they currently have. Yeah. To that point, we have had discussions about, and that's why I think the 20 has become important, because we could drop below the 99.63 for a short time, recuperate some of that cash, and not affect it. And so I think we need to add, and I was going to suggest this, add one correction into the report, and then there's two item threes. First of all, make the second number three, number four, and add this into this first sentence, which would be direct the LAP to hire all future classes to meet actual attrition by the end of the fiscal year. Insert that word in, consistent with the formula. That then allows you to dip below if you need to for a month or two, keep the formula intact, and then hire later on so that you get to the end of the year at the number, which is what we all agreed upon. So I think that would allow us to do that. Ms. Gruby, are you in the same title you were before this recent regime change over at PD? They tell me it's a lateral transfer. Okay, but it probably means more hours of work, right? Exactly, and less pay because of the furlough hours. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. I will try to take care of her. Another Along those lines, there was an issue by Councilmember Perry regarding the funding, how we were going to pay for this. Was there any resolve on that? Well, as we described on Friday, there's a few things that we have in the works. We know after January, the first quarter, we have three high-ranking individuals leaving, and once they leave, we're not going to fill it, request to fill it until the 1st of July. So we definitely will get the cost savings there. And then in addition to that, we feel we are going to be able to close the gap with ERIP and our salary savings on the sworn side. And so we do believe that we can make the approximate $4 million. Have you got an estimate on the number of ERIP employees? We have well over 200 right now. And then once they get notified, we'll see how many we send or not. But there's about 200. That will help. And there's all hurt and help. Yeah. Also an issue that came up regarding the ERIP is that the department managers are going to be given this direction to fill out, to figure out how they're going to fill those key positions on a temporary basis so we don't have a huge gap, whether a temporary assignment or something, so someone doesn't leave and no one knows what's going on. Correct. So that's also something that needs to be done. Correct. And we are looking at that in the reorg in terms of efficiencies and effectiveness. What can we bring in and align better? Okay. Very good. Now, for the question, we have one speaker card for this. That would be Marie Ann Bethard. Marie Ann Bethard going once, twice. Not here. Sold. 
That being the case, we have a motion to approve the as amended. As amended. Thank you. Yes. Uh, go thank forward. You. Thank you very much for both of your work over the week and uh, getting us to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. We we'll pick up item number six now because we can do that real quick, I think, and then seven. Item six, motion Perry Parks Cardinals relative to requesting the Bureau of Engineering to report on the status of the environmental impact report for the Parker Center site, including a timeline and next steps for site development and ceasing operations at the site. <laughs> And uh, the question I have, and for Ms. So, this may be one to you, too, from a budget point of view. I under, the money for this, the EIR, is coming out of the general fund. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's a million dollars out of the general fund for a project we're not going to do for at least a year. Is that correct? No, we, we already issued the NTP to Your the consultant. Your name? My name is Reza Bagherzadeh from Bureau of Engineering. Thank you. And we've already issued the what? The notice to proceed uh, to the consultant. The note on the consultant, but that can be pulled back. I'm just wondering from a finance point of view if it would be better to hold back a year because we're not going to vacate that building for at least a year. Uh, if we, from a general fund point of view, that would retain a million dollars in the general fund knowing that it's still a problem for us in a future year. Would you like to respond or would you like me to respond? Uh, since we've already issued the uh, notice to proceed to the consultant, there may be, uh, we have to negotiate with the consultant to, uh, per se, terminate the contract for right now or delay the contract until next year. That may be in thousands of dollars uh, lost to the general Apparently, fund. Yeah. I, I, as I know general city contracts in general, that's we always have that right to cancel yes. and or amend. That's interesting. So I think if we would ask them if we could amend it and add a year on to it, uh, put a million dollars back in the general fund for the short term, which is a big problem, obviously. Uh, we'll work with uh, engineering. We'll look into the possibility of doing that. There, There is always that engineering. ability built into the insurance, yeah. so with the CMA's <laughs> office. Um, there's always, usually within city contracts, there's the ability to add time to yeah. it. We do that very frequently. There may be some penalties, maybe not, depending upon we, what's actually built into the contract. Why don't you take a look at that contract? Um, we need to have this in council Wednesday then? Is that no, uh, all these are forthwith? This, uh, no, there's no date set for this council consideration for well, this. Uh, from their point of view, from a timing point of view, or can you wait till January for this? We could, we could wait until January. Right, why don't we do that? Let's instruct you to come back to us in January, the first meeting in January, see if there's a way to wiggle out of this, at least for the one year, and we'll put it back onto uh, year two funding then. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Question. What are they building on the south side where they took down the garage? The south side of Parker Center. They're building something. They took away the garage, the parking lot, and something's being built there. Uh, I think that's a parking structure, uh, George Aso's parking structure. I, and where do we get the money for Good morning. that? Morning, Tom Brennan from Facilities Management, the LAPD. The, uh, the construction site that's going on on the location of the old motor transport is actually the third component of the Police Administration Building uh, project, and that is the IESO parking structure. It's an underground parking structure um, that will be available for public parking. So it's going to be a parking structure. Just that southern part. Yes, sir. And then this doesn't have anything to do with the building. No. And then that's going to be for public parking or for police parking? No, that's for public parking. Public parking. And the that city's was part of the that was part of the community request in vetting out the entire location and, and building of the police administration building. So the city will receive money for that. I believe so. They'll be charging yeah. for parking. They have yes, people parking. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Then we'll hold that item to January. And I'll report back on that. Thank you. Okay. So item number seven. Does anyone have any questions on item number seven? This is item number, number seven. Four three. This informational information. No. I think that the statistics. Uh, come on. Yeah. Don't be. Don't be shy. Dave, go ahead. Good morning. David Doan, Commander of Los Angeles Police Oper Office of Operations. The item before you is a request from uh, this committee to come back and report on the change in the Code 3 policy after uh, a six-month uh, implementation. Uh, the stats are very small. The statistics are not very significant at this particular uh, point because we really only had about one quarter of the, of the uh, period that really reflected the policy being in place. 
it's our recommendation that uh, we come back to you when we have a full year's worth of data, which would be in June of this year after the uh, May implementation date. Uh, when we will have a much better set of statistics for you. Uh, what we have here now is very encouraging, but uh, certainly it's too small to uh, draw conclusions on. One thing I thought was interesting, that 39 percent decrease in number of assistance calls. We've eliminated the use of the term assistance call, uh, Councilman. We're no longer using that. It's either a backup or a help call, so assistance is no longer being used. But it's hard to break somebody of, I'm in foot pursuit, I'm requesting assistance. So we're sure we'll have them for a while. But then there's been a 2 percent decrease in officer needs help and then a 5.5 percent increase in backup. Backups replaced at assistance calls, so. But it went somehow. It you know how things are in the streets. There some days are better than others. So it, it, it's such a small change in the numbers, and it only represents about three and a half months worth of data. Uh, it's it's hard to reach conclusions based on that. But the initial indications are that it's not caused any significant increase in traffic accidents. Slightly in slight increase in traffic accidents involving code three responses, but overall traffic accidents are down. Again, the numbers are like ten difference between the two. Still kind of an awfully small to look at. And keep in mind that the value of having the revised code 3 policy is is the uh, uh, limited immunity that uh, we obtain for uh, civil cases and so uh, that aspect will be a lot longer in determining uh, if we were successful in that implementation strategy but we're certainly taking a look at how safe it is for both our officers and the community and the numbers are very small at this point so it's hard to reach a conclusion okay. very good when do you anticipate to have enough time to look back at, at and and we propose the entire year, Councilman. So, so, so basically, the first break point of a good look at look back is is 12 months. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the limited liability will take a couple of years to shake out. Yeah, that'll take longer to shake out. But our concern would be is if we have a significant increase in traffic accidents, regardless of our liability, that's not a good thing for us. Right. And so, that that would be worthy of some re-evaluation. So we're watching that very closely. But at that point, we'd go back and let's say do additional training or whatever. We'll have yeah. to decide what the causal factors are at that right. point as to whether it's our officers or whether it's the public. Very good. Thank you, Mike. That will be noted in file. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, Commander, excuse me. Okay. General Com we just got a general comment on this? No, no this, this is general public general comment. General public comment. That's for later. Okay, thank you. All right, then we'll move back into item number two. Item two, Department of Animal Services report relative to requiring the microchipping of any dog or cat redeemed by its owner from a Los Angeles City Animal Shelter. Good morning, Council Members. Linda Barth from the Department of Animal Services. Um, what you have before you is, um, is is a proposal that we make an alteration to the Municipal Code so that if someone loses their dog or cat and comes back to our animal care centers to redeem it, um, that rather than it be optional for them to buy a microchip in order to um, ensure that they're that they're reunited again in case the animal escapes again, um, that it would be required and that because it would be required they would pay the slightly lower $15 fee for microchips rather than the 25 which owners can now optionally choose to purchase. Um, this does not affect a large number of animals. Um, I ran some recent statistics and um, we, we redeem every year. We actually have a pretty high redemption rate um, for a public animal care center, about 9% of dogs. Um, uh, uh, go home as a redemption. Um, cats a very, very small number, but typically we uh, redeem about 4,000 to 4,500 dogs every year that are their owners come back in. More than half of those, um, well, more than half, almost 4,000 of them um, have a valid license, which does reinforce the um, the old saying that a license is your animal's ticket home. Um, as you are aware, we do not, do not license cats in the city of Los Angeles, so most cats that were redeemed, um, about 250 to 300 cats a year is all that go back to their owners. Um, about 100 to 150 of those, so a little, maybe less than half, already have microchips, and that's why we're able to identify their owners. Um, many of the, as again, as you are aware, I believe um, every animal that's adopted from an LA Animal Care Center has to have a microchip implanted. So again, looking at the statistics, what we find is out of the 4,500 4, dogs, for example, that come back, um, 60 to 70 percent of them have a license and more than half of them, well, that, about half of them also have a microchip. So it is true, I think, whether it's because we're implanting them, adopted pets that then escape and we're re able to reunite, or whether they're getting implanted at vets or other locations, that um, a microchip is an effective way also to get your pet home, um, even though licensing is still the number one way to make sure your animal gets home. Okay. So the question, uh, excuse me, I was reading 
something else when you first uh, made your presentation. The requirement of microchipping, obviously not cats, that, that can't be done? No, cats can be microchipped. We don't license cats. Don't license in this, cats. Yes. The microchipping of dog or cat redeemed by owner, are we supporting that or not supporting that? Yes, we, we would like to see that happen. Again, what I was... Um, the, Probably. Pay attention. That's why. I'm no, no, it's okay. Sorry. The language for that's in the in the report. The well, your fault. <laughs> there, anyway, as long as we can do that, to, to when they come back and get their animal. It it may not affect um, a large number of animals. I mean, for example, an animal that gets redeemed, there's a good chance. There's more than a, a 30 or 40 percent chance that animal was already microchipped. That's why it got redeemed. And it was already licensed. A 70 percent chance it was already licensed. That's why it was redeemed because so we those, were able to contact the owner. Those that aren't. That but those that are not, not, which is maybe say somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 dogs and maybe 100 or so cats. It's not a large number. It's not a major revenue issue, but for every animal that we can implant with the chip and get reunited the next time, we would just like to do that. That's so what we really for reuniting them and save the hassle yes. down the road. Yes. Ms. Carnes? Also, your department, um, are, you, are you going down in the amount of resources afforded your department or are you going up? It's a simple answer. I know what the answer is. But that. Is there anyone down. going up? <laughs> that, but, <laughs> But, yeah, they're hiring but hundreds of people now. But but no no. But my my point is this. So the fact that we're willing to give a discount rate on microchipping and things of that nature, in the long run, it's it's actually saves the department money because, because the animal. if an animal is microchipped, that means we keep them, we house them less number of days. Correct. Yes. That, yes. So if an animal is not thing. microchipped, then it takes longer. For the owner to find their animal, et cetera, for us to be able or to contact hold it the and owner, end up or not even be able to right. contact That's the owner because we have no way of knowing whose animal it is until somebody actually comes in and says, "Oh my gosh, you have my dog! Thank God, I found him!" Right. So the right. bottom line is, it is a cost-saving measure in order for us to figure out ways to encourage and/or implement uh, chipping of animals. Correct? Absolutely, it's a resource-saving measure in terms of our workload. So, so just so I, I understand the de how the department operates. Say, for example, somebody gets their car impounded, the number of days that it's impounded, meaning when they finally get their car out, they pay more money. But when it comes to animals uh, that we find and hold on to them, and somebody finally picks up their animal, the number of days doesn't make a difference as far as the person picking up their animal, correct? It is correct that um, basically someone will pay about the same amount as it takes to adopt an animal the first time their animal comes to us. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is what we found over time is that if we try adding lots and lots of fines or penalties to that, then the person says, I don't want the animal back. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a situation where we're holding it longer, we have to get it adopted, or they go to the parking lot <laughs> and they send their brother-in-law in the next morning to get the lower price. However, in this case, an animal that's come in once, didn't have a chip, but we're able to reunite it and we say well now you have to have a microchip but we're going to give you the, the lower adoption price for that when that animal comes in the second time there is an additional penalty so actually animals second and third time there are additional penalties and there's also penalties if the animal is not sterilized although that would be have to be resolved the first time they come in anyway no, but but at the same time the number of days is not tacked onto no, the penalty. That is not. Correct? It is but, not. But that's my point to you. The department being able to reunite an animal with its owner is actually a cost saving measure if you we can do it as correct. quickly as possible and as responsibly as possible. That is correct. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept the report? Motion to approve. Yep. I'm sorry? Card. Yep. Fellas Doherty, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, Phyllis Stewart with Animal Issues. I just want to correct one thing for you, Councilman Cardenas. The fact that the animal is microchipped may mean that it stays longer, that they hold it longer, because then they have an obligation to notify the owner that the animal is at the shelter, and you have to give them 10 days to respond and so forth. So just so that for the people that are listening, that they think that that doesn't affect. It can affect it longer. It can make it longer. But if, if it's for the purpose of identifying someone that will come and get the dog naturally in the long run, it's better. And we need to do this for cats. We need the license, so we have this for cats. I just there's one other thing I just want to be sure because you tend to to only hear the the good side of something, but on the other side of microchipping, please don't forget that and um, we've been through this a lot lately. That microchipping is not an indication of ownership. So if you lose your dog and it's microchipped, even though you might have had it licensed, 
and I find it, and I, like the general public out there, as you know, in most of our communities, do not even know about microchipping. I take in the dog, and I keep it, and I love it, and I license it, and you have never had a chance to get it, and then I go in with my, it gets picked up, and I go in with my license, that supersedes the microchip. The microchip is merely identification, not ownership. So there, there are going to be problems with that, and it's something that we're, it's going to have to be worked out with Avid and so forth. And also, if the animal is in very, very bad condition, even though the department may think it was the prior owner, we may all think it was the prior owner, the prior owner may say when it's brought in, oh, no, I haven't had it for a long time. It wasn't me. Those old dog fighting scars aren't mine. They still are going to have to re, re, um, redeem it. They're going to have to allow them to redeem it unless they can prove that they are the person that did that to the dog. So just so you know that there are some downsides, and so it isn't always just all rosy and, uh, for the animals just because they're microchipped. Thank you. But, but to the department on that point, you're not, the department doesn't act as a court of law if you have a dispute as to who owns it, correct? Correct? Correct. Correct. So, so obviously if a, an animal is microchipped and it's under the, the microchip says Tony Cardenas is the owner, but, but at the same time, excuse me, that Tony Cardenas microchipped the animal mm -hmm. and somebody actually comes in and has licensed that animal sometime later, the department has no choice but to, to go ahead and default as to who has the right to pick up that animal. But the department doesn't have the resources or the authority to act like a court of law, correct? That is correct. When, in those kinds of disputes, we um, uh, recommend that the people look to civil court to resolve an ownership issue. What we ordinarily do is if, um, if someone has a valid license and information Establishing ownership sometimes requires multiple pieces of evidence. Like here's a photograph with myself and my kid, at, you know, in front of our house yesterday with the pet. This is our pet. Here's my kid. Here's my vet records. Here's my license. So it may not be ordinarily it is not just a license chip discussion because there's other documents like vet bills and photos and things that play into that. Um, generally speaking, the, the, the owner of the dog that has the vet record, the recent material, and the current license is the pet, is the owner that gets the pet. It is Even though someone may come in and say, but wait, I had a microchip three years ago and that dog was stolen. And, you know, and we recognize that that can happen and we send it to court. That's right. Okay. So, and, and even because of the separation of church and state, you can't even pray for them. You just kind of hope that they get it satisfied somewhere else. <laughs> Not overtly. Yeah, exactly. You could, but you can't even tell them that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So that goes for order of the council. Item number three. Uh, Item three. Card in this motion? Motion design card is instructing the Department of Animal Services to report relative to the types of microchip equipment it uses, the success rate of microchips in immunotic pets and owners, technology used by other animal control agencies, and the estimated cost to equip all animal shelters with scanners that read universal frequencies. Council members, Linda Barth again. Um, we, uh, we had a discussion. I brought some sample of chips and readers at a prior meeting, but there were some follow-up questions. And um, a couple of the questions that, as I recall, were about veterinarians and how they obtain scanners and maybe what the process is for veterinarians to do scanning, um, what some of the costs were and so forth. So I just have a few follow-up comments and some other research if there's still some questions. Um, one is that a, a, a scanner costs between, say, about $150 or $600, depending on whether it's universal or not. Um, the department gets them free because we buy so many microchips. Veterinarians would have to purchase, and probably if they did, and they do, um, they would purchase a lower cost item. Um, you may recall that I reported that there are some websites which allow someone, even if they can't identify for if, if they can get any kind of a reading off the chip, they can go to the database and just identify who would have sold the chip. And that allows them to connect the dots. But generally speaking, veterinarians don't scan pets. The only reason that a veterinarian would scan a pet would be if there was a question or a concern about the ownership of the pet. Um, usually if a pet is presented to them as a, a client, um, you know, they're, they're providing medical services. They're not questioning under ordinary circumstances the ownership of the person who brought the pet in. Now, if somebody brings a pet that says they're being a good Samaritan, this pet got hurt, he's wandering in the neighborhood, and I want you to treat him, and, you know, can you help me figure out maybe they're, they're 
concerned about going to an animal shelter or they have a vet they like, now the vet may scan it to help see if there's some way of identifying the pet. Or they might contact us and so forth. So that's one situation. There may be a situation in which the vet has a dispute or a concern or maybe they're seeing an animal that seems to have been involved in fighting or some, something that kind of raises a flag. That might prompt a vet to scan. Or if someone comes in with a pet and says, I'd like to get this one microchipped. I got it from a rescue and I'm not sure if it is or it isn't. The vet might scan it also as a service and say, oh, there is one or there isn't one, and then implant one if there's not. So um, generally speaking, as a routine basis, vets wouldn't be scanning pets, not like we do. Every pet that comes through, under any circumstances, gets scanned when it comes in, it gets scanned when it's put in the kennel, it gets scanned when it comes out for an exam, and it gets scanned when it gets adopted out, or unfortunately if it's euthanized. So um, it's just a little bit of a different protocol. Um, generally speaking, you know, we charge $15. Um, and been charging $25 for option. If somebody comes in to us as a low price option for chips, it'd be $25. Chips cost us a little under $10 each. That includes registration. Um, vets often will not include registration. They'll implant the chip for anywhere from, say, $25 to $50, and then they give the people the registration information. They have to mail it in or go online, and that's an additional charge, $5 to $10, I guess, depending on which of the major manufacturers. So that's one service. We have a package deal. When someone walks out of there with their chip, we've d sent the registration in and done everything. So the uh, the difference between the cost of the chip, which is about $9.60, um, and the $15 we charge, or the $25, um, goes back to the general fund to defray the cost of the veterinary technician and the inventory control and all those things that are behind the scenes that it costs us to provide that resource. So it's not, it's we're not making a profit, but we are, I think, paying the expenses of managing the program by charging the 15 and the 25. And, and the public can avail themselves of that. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure uh, if there were any other specific questions. Um, I gave you a little bit of information about 2,000 pets, 2,000 dogs, and about 100 cats a year on average. And I looked at the last four years just to kind of get an average. Um, are returned have microchips already. So it, I mean, it is clearly an effective tool. Um, we did talk to several chip manufacturers and others about whether or not there's um, uh, a lot of push to try to, you know, really get this information out about this um, about this service. Um, you know, how it's marketed. Is it marketed at communities across different economic strata and, you know, cultural strata? And it, it really is, um, I think, a fairly new business. And shelters, vets, a lot of the venues as well as general advertising are trying to reach out. But there doesn't appear to be, um, at this point, any sense that since licensing, according to our statistics, is the number one way to get a pet home, and since licensing is required and it is low cost as well for a sterilized animal, it's only $15 a year, um, it, it probably is our number one option of educating everyone in the community at all levels and residence areas that it's the best way to be a responsible owner and get your pet home. Now, when it comes to the particular uh chip manufacturers, et cetera, they're not all literally on the same frequency, correct? They're on the same frequency. Well, they have different readings, but we have, and that was the sample that I brought you, we have universal readers at all of our locations. We do. That's correct. Okay. Uh, how does it look as far as us uh, understanding that the industry is going to more of a universal ability to not only have the chips uh, that are most likely to be readable and also the universal well, they need to read chips having that universal capability. I, I think the industry is moving in that direction. All of the chips manufactured in the United States operate at the same frequency. It's the European chips that operate at a completely different frequency. What happens is if you've got an AVID scanner, the cheapest AVID scanner, it'll pop up and say, it's a microchip, but I can't tell you the exact number. You know, so, so even that exists today. And they are moving in the direction of being able to cross-read one another. I think that's why there's those big databases that are out there. So... Um, um, you know, I, I don't know what um, necessarily what we can do besides the fact that we went through our RFP process. We emphasized, and in fact, the the uh, contractor that we proposed, one of the reasons that we recommended him to you is because they had they had that understanding of the need for universal scanners, and they provided them, and they were ready, and and so that was one of the pluses of that company. Yeah, I think it would probably take uh, something like uh, state legislation uh, in order to make it uniform. For example, if you're going to be selling chips in the state of California. You have to have, you have to be of this type 
in order to in order to sell those chips in california that you know that conform conformity would actually help departments that help veterinarians and help people and animals who worried about them when they when they you know unfortunately thinking about how cheap the chip was when they got it yet not realizing that you know it they can read the fact that there's a chip there it's not going to save their animal uh from being euthanized if you can't get a hold of the person who put the chip in there and or possibly the owner of the animal unfortunately thank you thank you okay with that we'll note and file yep. and item number four for just a, a instruction to the city attorney to uh, draft a ordinance, so a code. So, any questions or suggestions? Nope. Okay, so that would be the instruction of the committee to uh, ask city attorney to draft. And we have an. I'm sorry, I have the card, Ms. Doherty, again. I'm sorry. Thank you. Public comment. Phyllis Story, I am in support of this, and I really think that, that uh, Mrs. Barth needs to be really commended for the very, very hard and thorough work that's been done on this, and this should have been done a long time ago. There's just one thing that I think is very important to be included, and I think that this is the place. I have brought it up with her, and, and I'm sure she's not, it's not that we're in disagreement or anything, it just isn't in here, that if this dangerous, vicious or dangerous dog permit is allowed, that's something very, very new for us. And uh, you have children, Mr. Cardenas. Um, if you read the the dog attacks, almost every day a child is attacked by a pit bull severely in this country. A 70-year-old woman just died. An 85-year-old woman is still in the hospital right now. This is constant. This is every week. It doesn't it doesn't uh, dissipate. I wish it did. Um, but I really believe that every person within 300 feet of the property to which this is going to be issued should be notified that an animal that has attacked a human or severely attacked other animals is going to be considered for a dangerous animal permit on that premises um, because it is going to affect your property value. You're going to have to disclose that if you try to sell that property. And I think that the public needs to have input because the department does not get reports of every time an animal is out and commits a dangerous act, in other, or in other words, requires a person to defend themselves from harm. And the, the community has a lot more information than just the one complainant that may be coming in or the victim that may be coming in. So I really believe that it's very important to you as councilmen and to all of us who live in communities to know that if someone within 300 feet of us, that's only six houses away, is going to get this kind of a permit, that we are aware of it and that we have a chance to have input at the time that it's being considered. Um, so I think that I would like to see you include that, and I think this should be $250. This is a very special permit. And I thank you for that. I, actually, 500 feet is what we use for planning cases, yeah, and that's what I our computer I, systems are set up to do is 500 feet. I, I think it's very, very important because should there be a, a, a really horrible thing happen, you would not want that on your conscience as right. well as liability. That's a very good idea. And, I, and to the department, then you should add the cost of the circulation system, which you can get from the planning department. They'll tell you how much it is. They buy the labels, and they have to mail it out. Add that cost into the permit as well, then. And I, that's a good idea. Anyone have a problem with that? Okay, well. My question is, if they were to do that kind of notification, then would it require or trigger a hearing for the department to have? Well, it's, a, it's a manager's hearing. Uh. Linda Barth again. Um, yeah, the, uh, the way the situation exists now is a dog is either, well, it's not really dangerous, and so maybe you get some terms and conditions or nothing else, or the dog is ordered euthanized. And um, that the direction we're going is to not euthanize animals unless absolutely it's, you know, an attack leading to death, that kind of thing. Um, what we're proposing is to add this dangerous animal permit, which is very similar to other states. So it will be the result of a hearing. So there will have been a hearing a about public dangerous hearing? animal cases. Or the public may attend the hearing, yes. It is not a closed is it a, uh, is it a public hearing? Or in the past, I know with Barking Dogs, it's a city attorney hearing, which is not a public hearing. No, so are actually. Are talking about a commission it's a, hearing? It's a hearing officer. No, the hearing officer conducts officer. a hearing takes witnesses and evidence from both sides and in fact the public can attend or other witnesses or other interested parties they can attend and watch they can attend and testify All right. so the notification will be of the, of the hearing. well that's what I think what what you're talking about is adding that there be if, yeah. if that's what's um, the potential result is that we would add a notification to other people around you know right. this dangerous dog hearing is being held on this day so right. that they can attend and testify if they yeah, wish they choose to. 
The only thing that I ask of the department is, being that that's going to be part of the process that was just added by the chairman, that the department be honest with this committee and come back and report back as to whether or not it's overly burdensome financially to the department. You know, it could be that you end up having a bunch of people come to these hearings who are up in arms, and then all of a sudden the hearings are longer. Perhaps there's mitigation issues that the department is willing to comply with or what have you or impose. But I want to know how much it's costing the department, because I think it's important for all of us to understand that every time we add things to departments, we're not giving them the money to do so, and that if they're not passing it on to the customer, then they're absorbing that, and that might compromise the department's ability to do its work. So please make sure that you keep us informed as to whether or not you're able to handle these burdens financially as a department. And that actually gives a good point, because what you talked about, and I know that what we had talked about as a department when we went to the commission and they talked a little further about this was the idea that there should be signage and notification to neighbors once a permit was issued, which, as you suggested, could then be added to the permit fee. If it's an extra 50 bucks or whatever, you add that to the permit, plus your notification fee. If you're talking about ensuring that every neighbor has an opportunity to testify when the hearing is going on, that is a different, and you're right, the department would have to shoulder that cost. Our experience is that many of the situations, especially the more egregious ones, those neighbors are coming, because it happened, you know, somebody's teenage kid was walking the dog and some other dog got attacked, and the neighbors know. But we don't, only people who are on the witness list get notified by us. So if we had to reach out and identify addresses, you're right, it would be a cost, and if that resulted in only terms and conditions or no dangerous dog, there would be no way to recoup that cost. Okay. Very good. With that, those corrections will be added, and we'll send it to the city attorney for drafting. And that concludes today's agenda. We do have one public speaker card, Joan Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Joan Taylor. Before I begin my very brief remarks before the committee, I'd like to suggest that you make a firm order to Charles Berg, the chief, that he have strict training for all of the LAPD officers and PSOs, so that they recognize electronic misuse as a criminal act that it actually is. Some of, I've had one of, one Wilshire officer even injure my eyes by phone, and I've been shocked at the laxity in control at these meetings and other meetings, both of the commission, and the fact that some people treat it as humorous when it's basic criminal behavior. Now, and I think that the LAPD should be very firm. From Neiman Marcus to 99 cent stores, their staffs are trained to eliminate any misuse of electronics by customers or by staff. And LAPD should be in the forefront, not lacking. Now, my own remarks are very clearly outlined briefly in the paragraph that I gave to each of you council members. And I have asked different council members on this committee for help, but it's been highly inadequate because the mayor's orders against LAPD policy and law prevent LAPD policy from giving me safety from the second worst electronic abuse in LAPD records for many years. And I'm asking that you definitely increase your help to me because my eyesight has been badly diminished in the last three weeks, almost to the point where I fear blindness. I have sight only in the right eye, and that is literally destroyed over 75 percent in the last three weeks. And the same thing for deafness in the last three days. So please, don't disregard my request. Thank you very much. Give me the same safety you have. Incidentally, let me say one last thing. Some of you know me. Some of you know me because I've shown the council a way to save $10 million a year by getting rid of 30 senior center vans and drivers. And if I can save the city $10 million, you can spend a few thousand dollars and see that I have safety. Thank you very much. Just for the record, Ms. Taylor, 
policy issues of the LAPD are decided by the commission.